Pearl River, New York native, and that town has the highest concentration of Irish people outside of Ireland in the entire world. Now, Panetta in, moving on in, he scores! A backhand breaking opportunity set up by Glassman. It's 1-0, Colgate Raiders! Oh, that was a beautiful move there by Daniel Metzo off, to Metzo, off to Graf, who has a lot of space to pass off. De Young takes the shot. The rebound goes in. The Bobcats score. Ethan De Young swings the puck in on net, and it looked like Lipkin either tapped it in or trickled on by. Three defenders in the crease with Guylander. The game is tied. Eric Zank, your call for the player to watch, has registered a goal to tie the game. Four minutes in on the power play. It's a power play goal. The shot counts well, over 40, and we're in double overtime in the Arena of Miracles, Lake Placid, New York for the ECAC semifinal. Puck dumped in, Verboon on his backhand, rolls off his stick, but it comes out to DePaul, takes a shot, and the rebound comes out, and Mayan scores! Mayan, number 17, to scored and send the Colgate Raiders to the ECAC championship game. The Colgate Raiders have defied the odds as the dark horse and defeated the Quinnipiac Bobcats, the number one seed. Two to one victory. The championship, the White Law Cup within grasp. And they'll face Cornell or Harvard in the championship Their game. season is over. The Mitten Miracle in Lake Placid, New York. A two to one victory for the Colgate Raiders as the Bobcats are sent packing from Lake Placid. The one seed upset. The Colgate Raiders advancing to their fourth appearance, the only tournament championship they've ever had, 1990. A chance to break that against Harvard or Cornell, two of the ECAC's top programs. Eric, what went wrong for the Bobcats? Welcome to QBSN Radio. I'm Matthew Mugno alongside Eric Zank. We are here at Lake Placid, New York, the site of the miracle on ice in Herbrooks rink to cover the ECAC semifinal matchup between the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Colgate Raiders. Eric, the starting lineups are set. It looks like Quinnipiac's going with a defensive forward line first with Sky Brindamore, the 2023 ECAC defensive forward of the year, and last year's 2022 Ethan Day Young, who was the winner last year of the defensive forward of the year. What's the matchup looking like tonight? Well, I really like the starting lineup that Quinnipiac put out there. Brenda Moore, an Edmonton Oilers prospect, like you mentioned, just one defensive forward of the year. I like that they're starting with them because they have to play a defensive game that they've stuck to all season long if they're going to win tonight to advance it tomorrow. Eric, it's the site of the miracle on ice. The ghosts are in the buildings. We're sitting just about where Al Michael sat for that legendary call. If you're a hockey fan, you know that game was not for the gold medal. Very similar to this semifinal match. So we'll see if any miracles will occur on this ice tonight as Skylar Brindamore faces off against Alex DiPaolo for the faceoff and the Raiders retrieve the puck in their own end. Irwin starting on defense with Tommy Bergsland. They launch it into the zone wide. A Peretz and Fillion recovers to Jake Johnson. Johnson to Metza. Metza wheeling with it for the breakout. And it looked to be cut off by Verboon, but Johnson comes away with it. Brindamore into the offensive zone and the Bobcats chase. We are underway in the semifinal for the ECAC championship bid. And these two teams chase for the White Law. Looks like Fillion's taken down in the quarter and the Raiders may have a penalty here, Eric. Well, if you're Quinnipiac, you gotta take advantage of this now. They have to get out in front. If you're the Bobcats, they have to get out in front early in this one and take advantage of Colgate, who statistically has not had the best defensive season, and Quinnipiac on the other end has had a, an extraordinarily successful defensive season, so they need to take advantage of this early power play here. Tommy Bergsland marches to the box, a six foot three defenseman with the takedown in the corner. Bobcats on the power play, they have a lethal power play this season, a lineup where Brynamore will feature in front, Colin Graff, one of the nation's best players and a surprise transfer from the Union Dutchman is on the flank, Metza controlling at the point in a 1-3-1. Metza takes a shot and it's tipped by Brindamore on Guylander and he stops the play. First save we've seen from either goaltender, Peretz and Guylander. Another great matchup for the Bobcats as in the quarterfinal, it was Luke Pearson versus Yanni Peretz. Tonight we'll feature Carter Guylander in net for the Raiders. Yeah, well Peretz, there's no secret how good he is. He just won an award himself yesterday, ECAC goaltender of the year and he was elected to the ECAC all-conference first team. So Quinnipiac's got a pretty solid net minor in goal to say the least.
Graf controls at the flank and sets it up for Metza. Lipkin, a one-timer and a tip on net. It bobbles around in front and Metza can't keep it at the blue line. He walks out of the zone, retrieves and head up. Full steam, the quarterback sends it off to Lipkin. Lipkin eyes up, goes into the corner, spins off of a defender. Metza off to Graf, they play pass and catch. Graf turns, pivots toward net, and gets it up to the point to Metsu, rips his shot, a wrister, Brynamore whacks it wide, and Anthony Stark clears it out of the zone, not to be confused with Iron Man himself, even though he dons crimson. Graf walking into the zone. Looks for a heads-up play, but crashes into the boards, and now Dayoung controls. Dayoung normally at the bumper position is working with three of his teammates below the dots. Metsu with the puck at the point again, controlling. A pass off to Lipkin. Lipkin sashays on by and sends it off to the corner for Brindamore. A pass attempt to the points cut off and now Mitten comes in two on one with Young. Young off to Milden. Milden the backhand and it's saved by Peretz one on one in front of the net on the shorthanded opportunity and the Bobcats control it. And that right there shows why Peretz won goaltender of the year. Early save for Peretz right Derek. A mishap there in the ozone by Quinnipiac but Peretz there to bail his team out like he has all season long. Now pass off to the point. Lee possesses and gets it off to Norquist, the second unit on a shot. Guylander makes a beautiful save. Looks like he didn't know where it was, but it hit off of the five hole spot, off the pad, down and out of the crease. An odd save, Guylander looked like he didn't know where it was. Well, that was beautiful puck movement there by the Bobcats. And I thought up from up here it was a sure goal, but Guylander got over. Looked like prime Martin Brodeur there, but somehow keeps it out and we remain scoreless. Now I mentioned Metz's name a lot so far already on this power play opportunity. He just went to the bench. The captain on January 19th said on the ECAC Hockey Podcast that we've won a lot but not much. They've won three Cleary Cups in a row, a Bell Pot and the CT Ice this season, but they have limited hardware considering their regular season success and considering where they've been all year in the national rankings. Eric, this is another chance to go to the White Law Championship game for a third year in a row. What's at stake for the Bobcats? Well, a lot. It's it's really understated how much is at stake. I talked to Mike Lombardi yesterday post-practice, and he told me that last year's defeat up here in Lake Placid has really driven the team all season long and motivated them to get back here and have another crack at advancing. A lot of those players on this Quinnipiac team are in their final year of the program, so they really want to go out with a bang. Quillen laid a huge check on Brandon here as they enter the zone. It's Tellier, Quillen, and Fillion on the ice. Tellier and Fillion from the same home down, Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. The Sherbrooke boys on the four check right now as the puck comes out of the zone. And the Raiders enter three on two. Verbrun with the puck tries to spin and take a shot. Alex Young, number 21, takes a shot and Pretz fends it off. The Raiders come in full force on offense. Bergslin walks down and tries to get a pass off across the ice and gets it off, but Tellier intercepts. He tries to wrap it around the board to a teammate, but Berglund, Bergslin's there. Verboon in Gretzky's office gets a pass off to the point and a ripper from Glassman goes wide. Bergson off to Irwin, his partner. Irwin, stutter step on Tellier, spins around, making movement for himself at the blue line in some space. Runs out of space and the puck is out of the zone. Panetta coming on the ice with LaBelle. LaBelle checks Lee, but Lee gets it out of the zone and dumps it all the way down ice. Looks to be an icing. The touch up and the Raiders will have an offensive zone draw. Now Eric, the Bobcats are dominant in the draw in the faceoff dot. Skylar Brindamore, the number one faceoff man in the ECAC, and TJ Friedman, another top dog in the ECAC in terms of faceoff win percentage. Friedman taking the faceoff right now. The Colgate Raiders are not very good in the faceoff draw. Is that going to be something that uh, writes itself during the game? Is that a storyline we should be watching? I think so because I mean the importance of a faceoff is sometimes understated you know you win the draw and you have control if you're in the O zone you can set up a four check right away and you're if, it, if you're in the D zone and you win it and that's a prime opportunity to get it out and start a four check and for Colgate they've struggled in the dot this year only 49.4 percent of the faceoffs they've come away victorious while Quinnipiac has won 56.8 of their draws so that is definitely something to look at in this game as a as a potential difference the faceoff dot controls possession and it's another area of the ice that the Bobcats dominate and what's led to their success as you mentioned Eric it's understated how important it is now the Colgate Raiders deploy Raymond McGuire and Manderville Manderville is six foot five he'll be drawn as he checks Brindamore he'll be facing off against Brindamore Manderville is six foot five now ironically Ethan Manderville and Skylar Brindamore's 
Both of their fathers played for the Philadelphia Flyers in the 1999-2000 season. Ethan Manorville was born in Philadelphia that year. Brendan Moore's father would then be traded from, from Philadelphia to Carolina, where he would then have Skyler. And now they're facing off and they're matched against each other tonight. So very interesting storyline there as we see the Manorville line and the Brendan Moore line coming off the ice now. Both their fathers, former teammates in the NHL. A shot from Metz is covered up by a Gallander, and there will be a face-off to his right. Yeah, it's a small world, and you, you like to see stuff like that come full circle, especially at a venue like this. I mean, there's no bigger stage for college hockey than to be here at Lake Placid, aside from the frozen four, I suppose. But, yeah, Skylar Brindamore's father, Rod, is uh, no scrub himself. He went to Carolina and came away with a Stanley Cup in 2006 and now finds himself the head coach. Head coach of one of the top NHL teams this season as two of the top teams in the ECAC faceoff. Alex Young in the zone, and it's checked away by Graf. Graf, a great defensive play, but it comes to the point to Irwin. Irwin and Vashon. Vashon a shot, and it's saved, and a tussle at the net mouth. Rossinen gets into it with Alex Young. Alex Young, one of the top dogs, top players for the Colgate Raiders. Young on a podcast. It stated also the ECAC podcast on January, January 26th. This season has had a lot of ups and downs for the Raiders. The Raiders had a big victory against the Bobcats in Hamilton, their home arena on home ice on January 21st. And since then, they've been on a roll. They came back in a huge victory in their quarterfinal game one against St. Lawrence, and they take the ice right now, the brothers on the same team in Colton and Alex. Yeah, well, we talked about it off air that Colgate could be a potential dark horse, and they've already shown this season that they can beat the Bobcats. Now, we all know playoffs and regular season two totally different animals mm. so it's hard to draw some comparisons but on paper they split the season series so there's no reason here why Colgate can't beat this team once more if they can, can if they can play the way they did and, and have closed out the season there's a reason they're here. Brendan Moore to the net mouth and it's checked away by a Colgate defender. Vashon with the puck sends it into the zone and dumping on the forecheck. Colton Young brother of Alex Young the senior of the two Number 12 in on Rossinen, doing a great job on the four check working it, but Rossinen's able to break it out. Day Young tries to wheel with it up center ice, but it's picked off by Verboon. Verboon now in on Rossinen. Rossinen's getting worked into the corner. Norquist comes away with it in Gretzky's office and sends it off to his D partner. Rossinen flips the puck into the neutral zone. And the Raiders collect in their own zone and go back into work on the offensive end. Bretz has already been challenged by the Raiders tonight. And the Raiders have done a great job in the regular season, the two games challenging Pretz as they scored two goals and opened up the first game on November 4th, 2-0. The Bobcats got back into the game on three power play goals. Filling in with the puck, makes a move and gets it out of the zone for the line change. Chenecki and Air in with Desi Burgard. Desi Burgard's been facing injury concerns all season. The last full game he played was against Sacred Heart University in the Connecticut Ice Tournament first round, and he played game one of the quarterfinal, but then was shifted to become the extra skater for the second game and tonight. What does it mean to have a graduate student who scored a double overtime goal in the quarterfinal last year unable to go for the Bobcats? Well, it's a blow to morale, there's no doubt about it, but it could also be looked at as kind of lighting a fire under the team. You know, they come here without him, and they still want to win for him. They want to make uh, number 27, Desi Burgard. They want to make him proud. And I think in some way it could provide some motivation for the Bobcats to, to win it for him. Now, something that Metz had said on that same ECAC podcast was that all the young players come in and they want to be 1% better attacking the day and that they're so driven. So those young players have certainly not replaced Burgard by any means, but they've done a good job keeping the team afloat in their path to the white law. Now, a pass comes out to the point. Bergslin walking, gets a shot past Janecki Nair, but it goes wide of the net. Glassman working with Panetta. Panetta, a check on Janecki Nair as he tries to get the puck out to Legault, and he sends McGee. McGee moving on in, takes a shot high and wide of Guy Lander. And a pass off now to Johnson. Johnson down low, a move. Legault had the wide open back door on a forehand backhand move. And now Tellier takes a shot off the skate and almost trickles in the net as well. A few chances that have just gone wide of the net on wide open opportunities. Metza takes a shot. The puck gets to the inside, but the Colgate Raiders do a good job on team defense protecting the slot. 
Johnson gets a pass off to Metsu, who's walking into the zone over the blue line. Sauces the puck for Friedman, but it gets broken up by Manderville. And now a heavy forecheck in, and a player is taken down. It looks like Ben Raymond was tripped up and taken down by Jake Johnson on a back check. Either Johnson or Metza, Eric. I, I didn't see which player was breaking in, but a hard four check in front of Peretz, a close breakaway opportunity, and it looks like the Raiders will head to a power play with Johnson marching to the box. Well, that was great hustle there from Colgate, and I really like to see that. And I really don't mind that penalty from Jake Johnson there because if he lets that Colgate player get by him too far, that's a, a wide open breakaway. So the score remains deadlocked at zero. Now they have to fend off a power play. Colgate's power play, though, 33 for 152 on the season, a 21.7% success rate. So not quite as successful as Quinnipiac's, but still not too shabby. Lee tries to get the puck out, but it comes out to Alex Young at the point. Anderson controlling as the QB of the power play. Alex Young off to Anderson. Manderville acting as the bumper. Alex Young tries to pull the trigger. He is the trigger man on this, the strong side shooter. Young off to the point, creates space for himself, but Lee's there. Anderson heads up, looks, Manderville drives the shot and a rebound, trickles in the crease. Oh, Peretz, it looks like he's backing into the net and he's covered. He covers the shot in the crease and it looked like Lee saved a goal. Well, that looked like a pinball machine in the crease there. That's why Quinnipiac has been so great defensively all year. None of the players are afraid to sacrifice the body, just like Jaden Lee did there on a few occasions, but the biggest one there in the crease, getting it out of there. What an opportunity for the Raiders as it looked like, the, as you mentioned, a pinball machine. The puck was flying around in the crease. Peretz made a save. It was certainly behind him. It looked like it might trickle in, but Lee made a goal line save and the puck was still in there as Manderville hacked away. Manderville, the bumper man we brought up before, the father who is the Philadelphia Flyer, got the shot off at the bumper position and that's exactly what you want to do. You want to create some space, get that shot off in the slot and it looks like we'll have either a media timeout or a timeout by the team, wasn't signaled. Could also be a review of what just happened from the ECEC as to if it was a goal or not. Oh, were, the play's under review. There were a few times there where I thought the puck was set to go across the line and there was no chance for the Quinnipiac to keep it out it didn't look as though from our angle that it, it ever crossed the line but that whole sequence just shows to me what this game means to these players they know there's only four teams here at single elimination if they lose today there's no tomorrow and Quinnipiac there on the penalty kill just doing anything they can to prevent one goal yeah you know what it's not play to lose right it's play for that white law championship bid both teams have only won one white law cup and both have appeared for the Bobcats four times, this could be their fifth, and for the Raiders, it could be their fourth. So despite the team's successes, they have come up short in terms of winning White Law championships. Well, as I mentioned, I talked to Mike Lombardi yesterday after practice, and on top of saying that last year's loss has driven the team all year long, he also mentioned that last year really felt like a letdown. He felt like that they should have won, and it was unfortunate that they were they ended up getting eliminated. And this year he said that he wants to make things right. No goal on that play, even though they had the box open for the official, looked like maybe there, there could have been a chance that across the goal line. Now, something that's come up in recent years with hockey and video replay is there has to be some sliver of white between the goal line and the puck. And from our vantage point, it didn't look like the puck it, it could have gotten there. The, the puck was on the other side of Lee and Peretz, but it didn't seem like any of them had reached back over the goal line to retrieve the puck. Whatever the determination was, it'll continue to be a power play as 124 remains on the power play. A good chance for the Raiders just 30 seconds into their first opportunity of the game. Young, the trigger man, off to Anderson at the point. He walks the line like Johnny Cash. Young with the puck at the circle. It's broken up and Friedman chips it out of the zone. The penalty killers get a change now. Day Young and Brynn Moore the reigning defensive forward of the year and the current defensive forward of the year on the ice for the Bobcats with Rossinen and Lee. Well, that play there on the penalty kill for, for Quinnipiac again shows why they've been so successful, clogging the lanes, not letting Colgate get much generated here. Verboon off to Manderville, Manderville to Anderson. Verboon's now on the ice with this unit, Young off to the point. Anderson takes a shot, looking for a tip from Colton Young and it goes wide and Lee clears. Into the bench it goes. Well, we oh, sorry, Eric, what were you going to say? We see again there, though, that shot that sailed wide came all the way from the blue line. Couldn't have gone any mu much further 
or else it would have been offsides. And, and Quinnipiac has to stick to that, not letting Colgate get many high-danger opportunities. they got to keep him pinned to the perimeter. Alex Young had said on that ECAC podcast that, I'm a patient player, anything to get it to the open man, but I'm not afraid to shoot and be a little selfish at times. He said, it's special for me and my parents to be on a power play unit with my brother. We have a connection on the ice. He also mentioned that he's the trigger man and flank on the strong side, but this unit's gelled because they've played since 2021 together. So this power play unit has still yet to come off because they've been together for so long. So they have 19 seconds that remain on the clock. The Raiders come into the zone as the Bobcats were able to clear. Milton with the puck. Number 17 gets it off to Vashon. Vashon with the puck, sends it in front, and a tip from Milton goes wide. Friedman clears, and Quillen gets the puck all the way out of the zone. And that unit's back off again. And Rand Pecknold has rotated his penalty killers a lot here to keep some fresh legs. It's playoff hockey. Well, the penalty kill now improves to 83 for 98 on the season. Not too bad for the Bobcats. Impressive numbers from the Bobcats. You know what they say, Eric, your best penalty killer is your goaltender. They do say that, and Yaniv Peretz showed there while not facing too many high danger opportunities except for that initial one where there were about five players in his crease. He just showed why he is their best penalty killer and why he won goaltender of the year. Something you have to think of too is how far away this rink is from their home arenas. From the Bobcats, it's four hours and 33 minutes from Hamden, and from Hamilton, New York, it's three hours and 35 minutes. So both had quite the distance to come to this rink, to this legendary rink, a cathedral in the hockey world in a small town, Lake Placid, in upstate New York. It's snowy here this evening as the Bobcats are underway with the Colgate Raiders. If you're just joining us now, there's 9.50 left in the first period, a 0-0 game, five shots on goal for the Raiders who just had their first power play. The Bobcats had some good opportunities but look to rebound as the puck's been in their end for a swing in momentum here after the Colgate Raiders power play. Now Norquist with the puck battling in the corner with Ben Raymond. Raymond, the number one man on the four check. Gets a body on Johnson. Johnson clears, and it's another. Oh, no icing. The icing's waved off. Must have hit a player for the Raiders. Friedman intercepts, makes a nice move, and gets it off to Cipollone. Cipollone in, shoots, and a save by Guylander with the blocker. Cipollone twirls at the circle. Gets a pass off to Lombardi. Lombardi, Legault. Legault takes the shot, and it's tipped wide by Friedman. Friedman and Lombardi, the two goal scorers against the Raiders last season in the 2022 semifinal. This is a rematch. We have not mentioned that yet this broadcast. This is a rematch of the 2022 sem ECAC semifinal. Lombardi checks in the neutral zone, retrieves the puck and gets it off to Friedman, but it bobbles off of his backhand. Lombardi again sends it into the offensive zone. Cipollone in on the forecheck and that line will try and go for a change here. Well, so far it's been, there's been a few high danger opportunities, but for the most part, both teams have been pretty solid at limiting the offensive opportunities for the other teams. And that's what you expect in a game like this. You expect a tight checking matchup and one where it's, you know, mostly defensive based. And I think, like I said, for the majority of this opening period, that's what we've gotten. Looked like Ross Minton could have jumped there for a breakaway, but uh, they just missed on disconnect on the pass and missed the puck in the neutral zone and went down ice. So that will be an icing for the Bobcats. It's small plays like though, it is a game of inches that if Mitten goes in, could have had a breakaway opportunity, but now the Bobcats retrieve and set up in the offensive zone. Filling off to De Young who takes his shot and Guylander corrals that. It's stopped with the bread basket and we'll have another face off and a TV timeout. Eric, what have you noticed about the pace here? It looks like for a lot of the games we broadcasted this season for the Bobcats, they had complete control over their opponent. Looks like it's real back and forth here tonight. Yeah, I'm impressed with Colgate. If you look at the records, right, Quinnipiac 33-3 and coming into today, and Colgate 17-15-5. and So on paper, you'd think Quinnipiac would have the outright advantage and they'd be all over it. But Colgate has really impressed me and the fact that they really have been reading Quinnipiac's plays really well in, in uh, Colgate's D zone. And on the other end of the ice, they've been generating some pretty quality opportunities. Like I said, it, shots are even right now, five, five aside. So that right there shows it's been pretty even for the most part. And yeah, Colgate has really, really impressed me so far in, in just the way they've been moving the puck around and getting some of the Bobcats out of their, out of their positions and out of the lanes 
to generate some opportunities. Yeah, there's certainly some credit there with the power play. Johnson takes a penalty in the corner. Both penalties actually came from a check in the corner. So it'll be interesting to see how the physicality plays into this game as both teams want it. They're hungry for this ECAC championship bid. Something you mentioned before was Yanni Peretz, the ECAC goaltender of the year, and there's a lot of accolades that came their way last night at their banquet. The ECAC banquet was last night. Yanni Peretz and Colin Graff, both Hobie Baker top 10 finalists. Peretz, Mike Richter award finalist, broke the QUNECAC shutout record with 20 shutouts on the season. Verboon was named the Scholar Athlete of the Year. And Sam Lipkin is the CHA Rookie of the Year watch list. And he is also ECAC Rookie of the Year. He was also on the rookie, of the, the rookie team for the ECAC. Sorry, a lot of rookie titles there for Sam Lipkin. He doesn't take the ice right now, but it will be DeYoung, Brindamore, and Fillion with Johnson and Metza against Young, the Young Brothers, and Vashon. I think for a team like the Bobcats, you kind of expected quite a bit of hardware coming out of, from this season, and we certainly got that. And we also don't want to forget to mention that head coach Rand Pecknold won his third consecutive Tim Taylor ECAC Coach of the Year. So the leader of this Bobcat team. He's been with the program since it made the jump from Division II to Division I. He was there when M&T Bank Arena in 2007 opened. I believe January 28, 2007, the arena opened. So Rand Pecknold has been in the building and has been a cornerstone for the program, the cornerstone for the program since it began. And the Bobcats ice the puck. It'll be a faceoff in there. And again, the Raiders are doing a great job keeping pressure here, Eric. Yeah, I mean, look, they just forced another icing on Quinnipiac. That's not something we've seen very much this year from, from the Bobcats, but we've seen it a decent amount to start this game, and that's a good sign if you're a Raiders fan. The Raiders are certainly making the push, and we'll see Raymond McGuire and Manderville. Oh, my apologies, Mitten, DePaulo, and Verboon on the ice taking the draw against Brindamore's DePaulo. DePaulo looked to have won the draw, but the puck came out to DeYoung, and he chips it into the offensive zone. Now Tellier, Chinecki, and Aaron Burgard on the ice. Burgard, another shift for him, player that was scratched and considered an extra skater. He's an extra skater tonight, but it's good to see he's getting reps as he's been dealing with an injury all season. Nordquist working DePaulo in the corner, and now Rossinen comes into the corner with the hit, and it looked like a hit to the head of DePaulo. He gets up no call on the play. Now the puck comes out. To Verboon in the neutral zone, he chips in and Mitten and Verboon in on the four check. Circles the boards. Norquist gets checked hard by Mitten. Chinecki and Eric comes away with it. And the Raiders settle back, sending just a single four checker in right now. And McGuire, McGuire, another tall forward for the Raiders. You got to think that the Raiders recruited big players to face off against teams like Cornell and Harvard. Manderville with the puck, a great play to set up. A breakout, and they're stood up at the blue line by Legault. A great stand up and a check by the Raiders. Lipkin giving a shot to McGuire after the play. This line, McGuire, Mandeville, and Raymond, certainly tall boys, six foot two. McGuire, six foot four, Mandeville, and Raymond there to facilitate play at five foot 11. Yeah, well, if you're Cornell, you know, you probably think that the refs may have missed a call there, the, the head to the head. Accidental from Quinnipiac's point mm. of view. And if, if you're Quinnipiac, you take what you can get from the referees, but if you're Cornell, yeah, they probably think they missed the call, so Quinnipiac might have to deal with some, they were already gonna have to deal with some physicality, especially in a game like this, but it might be a little amped up after that one. The Raiders certainly look to have a physical presence as that's what succeeded for Yale, and that was their formula for success against the Bobcats in the first period of game one, where the score was also zeros by the end of the first period, but the series got away from them because they weren't doing a responsible job in the physical department. Now Colton Young breaking in, takes a shot, and it yawns over the cage and the blocker of Yanni Peretz. And now the puck comes back to Young, who sends it to Anderson. Anderson off to Pearson. A move, trying to break into the offensive zone, and a check from behind on Young from Graf and the Young line of Graf, Lipkin, and Quillen. The York Hill boys going to work. Lipkin with the puck. Sends it off to Quillen. First time we're seeing this line united this game, and they have been the driver, the motor for the Bobcats on offense. The Energizer Bunnies. Lipkin sends it into the offensive zone, and Quillen Harden on the forecheck gets fended off by Pearson. 
Pearson sends it off to his partner, Anderson. Anderson mobilizing. Sends it off to his partner, and they break in. Puck launched into the offensive zone for the Raiders, and Young, Colton Young, in on the forecheck. A breakout misses Lombardi, and it comes away to the Raiders. Stark, Anthony Stark, sends it into the offensive zone. There is a Tony Stark on the ice tonight for the Colgate Raiders. Johnson doing battle in the corner, but Verboon comes away with it. Verboon up the boards, but it comes away, and Lombardi moves on in. He's a horse, he's a power forward, gets the puck in deep, Cipollone with the puck, fans on the pass, and dumps it below. Lombardi, Friedman, and Cipollone, a workhorse line. They are the sandpaper for this Bobcats program. Mitten with the puck, with no help, sends it off, but Lombardi comes away with it at the top of the circle. And they circle back into the zone to start a cycle. The defensive unit for the Bobcats changing. Lombardi, a pass off to Friedman, to, who gets it to Rossin at the point. Rossin and walk in the line. Still walks with it. My apologies, Nordquist takes a shot and it's gloved easily by Guylander. Guylander was challenged early with a shot that trickled into the crease, but other than that, the Bobcats have not gotten into the inside of the ice. That was another shot there from the point that, again, if it went any further back, it could have been called for an offsides, which Col I'm sorry, yeah, Colgate doing a really fine job, just like Quinnipiac on the other end, of just limiting their opportunities to the perimeter where it's not really high danger opportunities for, for either team so far. So both teams really stick into a defensive-minded start. Sky Brindamore taking the draw again. He is the number one faceoff man in the ECAC. Wins the draw, gets it off to Rossinen, who scored a big goal in the second game of the quarterfinal, and that broke the ice for the Bobcats. A point wrister from Rossinen, who played exceptional through the first two games, and he's played well tonight, although the Raiders would argue that he had a missed head shot to one of their players in DePaulo. Could have been a five-minute major easily. I would think that it could have been any sort of penalty, but it was missed by the officials. Young doing battle along the wall with Fillion. Feeling a self-proclaimed playmaker was on a hot point streak in January and looks to continue adding to that as he's one of the other young players that came into the program and has filled some holes from players that departed last year. Yeah, that's what you want to see. If you know your young guys coming in, if they can fill the shoes of the departed players, and they have this season, and you know that's why they're here. Final four teams in the ECAC tournament here in Lake Placid, they've done a really fine job this season at, at filling those shoes. Fillion recorded 11 points last season, and this season he's at up to 17, and he's a plus 17, so the Sherbrooke native doing a fantastic job getting on the point sheet. A pass off now as the Raiders break into the zone and set up. McGee retrieves with Lee. C.J. McGee is a Pearl River, New York native, and that town has the highest concentration of Irish people outside of Ireland in the entire world. Now, Panetta in, moving on in, he scores! A backhand breaking opportunity set up by Glassman. It's 1-0, Colgate Raiders! Oh, that was a beautiful move there by Daniel Panetta on the breakaway, and a great pass from the blue line to catch him in stride. Quinnipiac with a little defensive breakdown there, and Colgate took advantage. That's what good teams do. And the Raiders now find themselves ahead by one. They trail in the shot category, but it's all about capitalizing on your opportunities. And Colgate now ahead 1-0. Panetta found the hole on a high four-check play. A great job by the third forward to stand up Lee, and I believe Graf at the wall to make that play happen. Panetta receiving, faking the shot, going 5-1 on Peretz. Peretz had 20 shutouts this season, so it is a, certainly a badge of honor to say that you've scored on one of the nation's premier goaltenders and elite goaltenders. The Raiders come away with the puck now on their own end and head up ice. Colton Young off, they get a pass, and they're into the zone. The Young brothers on with Vashon. They're doing work in the corner as Lipkin can't come away with it, but Graf retrieves. Graf off to Lipkin, Lipkin moving up ice. Lipkin sauces it to Quillen. Quillen on his forehand takes a shot, but it goes wide, probably looking for a pass. And now Puck comes to the point. Johnson shoots, sand. it's right to the crest of Guylander. Well, that was important for Quinnipiac there. A quick response, although they, they don't score on it. To get right back on the four check for the Bobcats is really important. And I'm sure Rand Pecknell is going to stress that until the end of this period and into the second to just shake that one off. It's still early. 
get back to your game, get back in the ozone, and, and stick to what you've been doing all season long because it's worked. Panetta is a first year forward, so first time in this tournament. He had four goals this season, and he's the cousin of former NHL agitator and two-time Stanley Cup champion Andrew Shaw. He's had one goal and two assists in the three ECAC tournament games played this season, so Panetta is certainly making a name for himself as a first year. He, oh. had a, he had a goal in game one last weekend and an assist in game two, so he's been on fire lately and keeps going there with that early goal. The Colgate Raiders were down 3 nothing in their first game of the quarterfinal series and stormed all the way back for a 4-3 overtime victory. They won their second game, I believe, 3-2 or 4-2, and they defeated Dartmouth in their first round series. So the Raiders are picking up steam in tournament play. This is a team that made it in. Reminds me of 2012-2014 Los Angeles Kings. Yeah, don't remind me of that. <laughs> Eric is a Devils fan now. Puck comes out to Lombardi, the sandpaper line out for the Bobcats as Friedman, Lombardi, and Cipollone go to work. Lombardi with it on the half wall and ties it up as he's being worked by DePaulo, the center for that line, the top line for the Raiders. And a pass and catch at the point, a shot off from Rossinen, and he gets worked by Mitten. Now Young comes away with it. My apologies, that's Verboon. Verboon loses the puck in the neutral zone to Lombardi, who's streaking on in. Gets a backhand pass off to Brennan Warrior, takes a shot from the point, and it's easily trapped by Guylander, who hasn't been challenged again on the inside of the ice. We saw Peretz, the one opportunity that the Colgate Raiders got on the inside of the ice, aside from that pinball play, was the goal. That's right, but I do like that approach from Brendan Moore there. Just turn and shoot. You know, good things happen when you get the puck on net. You never know what can happen. And Brendan Moore saw that there wasn't many reinforcements deep in the zone there. So I do like that approach, just turn and shoot. Sometimes you shoot for a rebound and something happens. Unfortunately for Quinnipiac there, nothing did mount from that. But I do like that approach there. Yeah, and Eric, Brendan Moore is a playmaker as he had three assists in the second game of the corner final against Yale. And he's had, he, in the 2022 tournament, five points in the six ECAC and NCAA tournament games. So he's certainly not only just a playoff performer, but also a playmaker. Now Peretz has it behind the net, corrals it and gets a pass off to the wing for DeYoung. And now Brendan Moore is moving on in with a head of steam. He has three men with him. Brendan Moore tries to get a pass off through a defender in Bergsland, but Bergsland breaks up the play. A good job on defense. The puck up the wall is broken out, but Metzik comes away with it in the neutral zone and breaks up the Colgate Raiders play. Belpito off to Bergsland. Bergsland the pass. Johnson steps up to check Young. Vachon in. Metzik gets checked hard by Vachon. Quillen and Metzik working behind the net. Vachon hard on the four check. Disrupting play again for Colton Young to come away with it. Young to the front, and it doesn't find his stick as Alex Young is a righty. If there was a lefty there, it could have been a sure quick one-timer in on the slot as the puck trickled through the danger zone of the ice. Quillen comes away with the puck. The York Hill boys, the Quillen, Graf, and Lipkin line come, come away with it. I've been referencing to them as the GQL line, but they play at M&T Bank Arena on York Hill. Figure the York Hill boys, the young line for the Bobcats. Graf taking a one-timer. Colin Graf, third in the nation in points. That's the first time we're saying his name tonight. Yeah, I thought we were going to mention him a lot earlier. 20 goals on the season, 54 points. Transferred here last season from uh, Union, where in 37 games he had 22 points. And last weekend versus Yale, he had a goal and four assists across those two games. So, again, not a bad player there for Quinnipiac wearing number 11. He has certainly grown more than any other player for the program as he had 22 points in total last season. The draw is won, but the period is over. The Colgate Raiders step out of the first period with some miracle ghosts in the building, up 1-0 against one of the top teams in the nation, the number one seed in the ECAC tournament, the Quinnipiac Bobcats. We'll be back in 15 minutes for the second period of action. For Eric Zanka, Matthew Mugno, join us in 15 minutes for the second period of the ECAC semifinal of the Quinnipiac Bobcats versus the Colgate Raiders.
And we are back for period two of action in the ECAC semifinal between the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Colgate Raiders. The Raiders recorded a goal on a break in, an in zone turnover. The third man on the four check, Glassman, finding Pinella for a 1 0 breakaway goal, sliding at five hole on Peretz. One minute until puck drops here in the second period. Eric, what occurred in period one, and what should we look for in period two? Well, I think for the Bobcats, it was a wake-up call for Quinnipiac. I think they may have come into this game, whether they are going to say it or not, they may have just been overlooking Colgate a little bit. As the one seed that, that the Bobcats are, looking at Colgate, the five seed, it's easy to look at them and go, all right, we got this. Let's look, you know, let's look ahead to tomorrow. But Colgate, I think, just gave them a wake-up call and said, listen, we're here for a reason, too, and we're not going to make it easy. And they certainly did it in that first period. As we look at the shot, uh, the shot chart, as we mentioned off air, only three Quinnipiac shots were in close. The rest were all around the perimeter. While Colgate, they're trailing in the shot board, only six on goal, but they're making the most out of them. All their shots are in prime areas. And as a result, they have one goal out of it, while Quinnipiac, all their shots from the blue line and from the perimeter, low danger opportunities have resulted in a goose egg so far. So I think for Colgate, it's been a, a really good first, it was a fir really good first period for the Raiders and a, a definitely, like I said, a wake up call for Quinnipiac. Now we'll see if the luck of the Irish and the miracles that have occurred on this ice and the ghosts in the building can turn the tide for either of these two teams as the puck is set to drop here for the second period. The line out for the Colgate Raiders, their top line of Matt Verboon, Alex DePaulo and Ross Mitten and for the Bobcats, again, Philly and DeYoung and Brenda Moore. That defensive line has been relied on a lot tonight so far from head coach Ram Pecknold, ECAC Coach of the Year. DeYoung moving in on the wing, sends a soft pass off around the boards to Fillion. Fillion looking for DeYoung, who's finding some open space. A pass off to Johnson at the point, who's moving to try and, and find a lane around Mitten. Metza takes a shot and it's blocked, and Verboon's moving on in. Tries to cut in to get a pass off to Mitten, but now it's a three on two. A dump off, Mitten takes a hard shot off Perrette's shoulder. He makes the save. Puck comes around to Mitten, who finds Verboon. Verboon off to DePaul in the slot. Verboon, a soft shot goes wide. And the Raiders have some jump here at the start of the second period. A pass around the boards is sent in from Bergslin. Brenda Moore gets the puck as Metza ties up a four checker. Brenda Moore with the puck again with his stick lift off to Metza. Metza to DeYoung. DeYoung on his backhand, circles in the zone, gets his motor going and sends it off to Brenda Moore. A tip off a stick from Stark, and the puck is now moved from the Raiders' end north through the neutral zone. Graf with the puck. The York Hill boys on the ice for the Bobcats and Graf, Lipkin, and Quillen. The GQL line. One of the dominant lines in not only the ECAC but the entire nation is Colin Graf is third in the nation in goals, assists, and points. Alex Young and the Young Brothers on with Vashon. A big matchup here. The two highest producing lines on the ice for both teams. And Anderson sends it into the zone for the Raiders to start a cycle. On his backhand, Alex Young is tied up by Lipkin and Quillen. Quillen with the puck in his own end, moving up ice. Eyes up, he squirts through the neutral zone and sends a pass off, but it's intercepted. Well, a and real similar start to this period, excuse me, as, as um, compared to the first one where really not, um, neither team letting uh, the other one get much generated here in terms of shots or, or passes off. Both teams have been in great defensive position to intercept any kind of chance that uh, the teams are, are having here. And as we saw in the first period, aside from that one defensive breakdown for Quinnipiac, it was scoreless for most of it. So I think we're getting a kind of a preview is what the rest of this game is going to look like. It's really tight checking, defensive defensive minded. And you know what they say, def defense wins championships. Looks like both teams are settled in. I would agree. And it, it's from the start, the opening draw, you had those defensive uh, defensive lines paired up as I mentioned the young line with Vashon and the York Hill boys line for the Bobcats are the highest producing but they were not the starting line or listed as the starting lines. Legault takes a shot but it's blocked away by Raymond. Chinecki and Air off to the point. Legault with the puck sends it off to his partner. Lee dumps it below the dots. 
McGee in as a forward. He's been a utility skater all year. CJ McGee from Pearl River, New York. Highest concentration of Irish settlers outside of Ireland in the entire world. CJ McGee's from that town, and they also have the largest parade outside of New York City's for St. Patrick's Day, which is today. Everyone's Irish on St. St. Patrick's Day, though. Lee ties up a forward in the zone. The line, Glassman, Panetta, and LaBelle on the ice. The goal scoring line for the Colgate Raiders. Anderson walks, and Irwin takes a shot. My apologies, Pearson takes a shot, and it's blocked away by Cipollone. Cipollone recording a block on that play. McGee with the puck. Sends it off the glass and out. Drops, but Cipollone is too far away from it. Guylander covers and stops the play. We'll have a face off to Guylander's left as Guylander has not been challenged much. A lot of the shots from the Bobcats coming from perimeter plays. And that's what Colgate's just been really doing great so far this game is pinning them to the outside, not letting the Bobcats get anywhere near their netminder. And that's been a huge reason why, yeah, Quinnipiac has 13 shots on goal, but not many of those have been high danger. And uh, Guylander stood tall when he's had to, but Quinnipiac's going to have to find a way to get some, some of those dirty goals that we talk about sometimes, the ones that maybe aren't going to make the ESPN top 10 highlight reel, but they're going to have to start crashing the net and making something happen here because right now Cornell's defense has been in all the right spots, all the right positions, clogging the lanes, not letting Quinnipiac generate much of anything. Metzik gets back on D as the Raiders come into the zone and a shot on a rebound from Mitten goes on net, but Peretz is there to make the save with his leg pad. Metzik jumped in on the offense. He defends with his skating ability, similar to Adam Fox in the NHL or Quinn Hughes, where he's not brawn, he's not a big defender, he's not a huge player like an Ethan Manderville for the Raiders, but he defends with his skating and positioning, his angling, what he takes. The 49 captain in history battling right now and Johnson checks the puck off a Raider four-checker stick. We have a stoppage of play. A high stick. Looks like faceoff's gonna come out just outside the Bobcats end here. Ethan, another player we haven't touched upon a lot tonight is Sam Lipkin, who is the ECAC Rookie of the Year. Now, we talked about Graf, his line mate, Jacob Quillen's name has come up on the defensive side of the puck and on the penalty kill, but what has Sam Lipkin meant to the Bobcats this season? Well, a ton, and we talked earlier about the young guys coming in to fill the shoes of the, the departed students, and Lipkin has done just that. He's an Arizona Coyotes prospect, so personally his stats speak for themselves, but 12 goals, 23 assists for 35 points on the season in just 34 games, so he's playing at a point-per-game pace, which is impressive in its own right, especially for a first-year student. The Philadelphia native last weekend had an assist and three shots uh, over the two games against Yale. And as I mentioned, a 2021 seventh round draft pick to the Arizona Coyotes. Also won a bronze medal at the World Junior Championship this year. Rand Pecknold coached Team USA and Sam Lipkin to a bronze medal at the World Junior Championship. A tournament famed for how many prospects and NHL level talent come out of the tournament. But it seems to be like a modern Olympics, which features younger players. The Olympics today have featured NHLers and professionals. Back in the day, it was youth and young players like the Miracle on Ice in 1980 where the USA team featured all college players like the players we see on the ice tonight versus the professional Russian players. Now that was not for the gold medal. They beat Finland and had to come back in that game as well, winning three to two against the Stasny brothers who would be NHL players. Brendan Morin takes a shovel shot and Guylander makes the save with a blocker under his arm. Gonder made a nice save. Brendan Moore had two shot opportunities on this play that were good, where he tried to capitalize using his size and speed, but just couldn't finish. Well, see, that right there is why Quinnipiac is the number one seed coming into this weekend, because that play, although Col Colgate has been really, really solid defensively so far, that play came out of virtually nowhere, and the Bobcats come oh so close there to tie in this game. A great move by Brendan Moore. Just couldn't sneak it past Guy Lander, but game of inches. It we couldn't have, it couldn't get much closer than, than what it did. DePaulo retrieves the puck after a good opportunity from the York Hill boys. And they do battle behind the net to intercept. Jaden Lee taken down. Quillen also taken down by DePaulo. Looks like something's lying on the ice there. Not sure what it is. Lipkin gets hit in the neutral zone with the pass, but it hits off his stick and back into their defensive end. Legault, 200 feet 
looking up ice to break out. Behind the net of Yanni Peretz, who has surrendered a goal tonight on eight shots. A play that really can't be blamed on Peretz as it was an in-zone turnover that caused the play. It's hard for a goaltender to get settled and get their footing when the puck's turned over in their own zone. It's less time to set up when a turnover occurs only 20 feet away and it's a one-on-one. -on -one. A shot and a tip from the Raiders. A shot point from, from the point from Anderson is tipped by Glassman. This line going to work again. And a pass comes out in front for the Raiders, but it's broken up. And the puck is lifted over the glass and out by Quillen. Look like it'll be a face off to the left of Yanni Peretz. Lipkin there gave, um, excuse me, who is that? Gave Pearson Brandon a little tap on the side. Pearson no, he was didn't appreciate the, uh, that. Pearson was the everything college hockey. If you follow that social media page and podcast, they labeled him the sponge of the week as he had eight block shots last week in their series against St. Lawrence that they came back in. Well, that's all part of it, and that's a huge part of it, especially playoff hockey, is sacrificing the body, not letting those shots even get through to your goaltender. Rossinen tied up, but Metza comes away with the puck. Lipkin streaking on in through the neutral zone over the red line, but the puck and pass is broken up. Alex Young with the puck. Spins off the check of Graf. Loses it, and Anderson retrieves, sends it back into the offensive zone, delivers it to Peretz, and now Metza slaps it for a one-time pass for Graf, but it's broken up by Colton Young, who's in on the forecheck. Metza circles around the boards for Graf again, finds Chinecki in air, who passes it off along the boards to himself and gets past Pearson. Chinecki in air sets up. He's had a stout game, doing all the small things right so far. Tellier. Tries to circle and get the puck back into the zone. Chinecki Nair shaking off a check from Pearson. He takes a shot, and the rebound comes out, but Burgard didn't, it lost it in his feet, and Gallander made the save. Now coming the other way, the Raiders, but it's broken up, and they send it into the their offense's zone. Rossinen picking it up in the slot. Raymond did a great job on the back check there to break up the play in front of Gylander and to broke the puck out for that Series of plays to unfold. Tellier moving around the net on his forehand. A lefty shot goes on net and it goes wide. Friedman, Lombardi, and Tellier on the ice. Now McGee. McGee acting as a defenseman and s s utility skater. Cipollone takes a shot and it goes wide. Fumbled over my words there for a moment, Eric. McGee looks up ice and it hits off the skate of Friedman and it's sent back. Mitten with the puck. Makes a nice move around Nordquist to get in on the four check, but doesn't beat Nordquist to the puck, retrieving it again in their own end. Friedman sends a pass off to the slot and it's broken up. And Glassman's checked off by Legault, looking for a breakaway. Puck comes back into the zone for Anthony Stark, New York, New York City, New York native, where Avengers Tower is, if you can believe it, in the Avengers film universe. Tony Stark, the Colgate Raider, was born in New York City, New York. Anthony Cipollone in on the four check. Shakes Belpito, but he's able to get it out to Glassman. Glassman swings it for LaBelle. Number seven of the Raiders checked hard by Legault. And a lot of back and forth action results in some sort of stoppage of play. I think Quinnipiac's starting to get physical though, and I like to see that from their point of view because right now what they're doing isn't generating much. They're still shooting from the blue line for the most part. They had one good opportunity just a, a few minutes ago. But for the most part, not many of their chances have been quality. But for the last few minutes, I've seen a lot of checks finished, which I, I didn't see much of in the first period there. But I think Quinnipiac has, has realized that they're going to have to start digging deeper here and getting more physical, start finishing off checks if they're going to generate chances here. A shot off the draw from the Raiders from Youngo's over the glass and out of play, so they'll reset to the right of Peretz. And we haven't seen a shot registered on the scoreboard in a little while from either side. So they definitely have, as you mentioned before, Eric played a lot more of a defensive style. We're seeing sh uh, block, blocks in lanes, sticks in lanes, heavy checks, a lot of back and forth dumps into zones and a little bit of difficulty getting through the neutral zone for both teams. <clears throat> the Bobcats, looking to break out here. The Raiders on the four check. 
Anderson, and a shot from Young goes up and over the net, and Vachon hits into Peretz, and it looks like the official's arm is up. Possibly a cross-checking call on the Bobcats as, oh, Vachon's going to the box. Maybe goaltender interference. Interesting calls. I thought he got pushed into the crease, but he did take out Peretz, so it looks like the Bobcats will go to the power play for the first time this game, a lethal unit. I was thinking cross-check too, but if you're Quinnipiac, you'll take what you can get. They're going back to the power play. Again, coming into tonight, 35 for 145, a 24.1% success rate against a Colgate penalty kill that's not too bad in itself, 84.3 success rate, the Colgate penalty kill. So we'll see what comes from this, but a great opportunity if you're the Bobcats to tie this one up and get back into this game. 14 shots, but nothing to show for it. The Bobcats struggled historically on the power play, but this season they've really turned it around. They're third in the ECAC, as you mentioned. So the Bobcats have certainly capitalized and utilized the assets that they have. This unit's been together all year, and it's rare that we see power play, power play unit two come on the ice for the Bobcats as Lipkin controls in his end, looking to get things jump-started. Day Young, who's typically in the bumper position, crossing over the blue line. In the zone, gets a pass off, but it goes over Brynn Moore's stick and around the boards, but Graf gains possession. Stops, gets a pass off to the point. Lipkin with the puck, takes a shot, and it slows down in front. Day Young with the puck, Lipkin takes a shot, and it rolls off his stick, and he's checked heavy in front of the net, and Bergsland wraps him up as Gylander makes a save. Well, I like that early sequence there from this power play unit. They got open lanes, they found some open shots to take, and they took them, and that's what we didn't see much of in the first period. The shots, first of all, when they did come, weren't of high danger, and a lot of times I felt Quinnipiac maybe one extra pass that wasn't necessary, but on this early four check of this power play, they're shooting away. So if you're head coach Rand Pecknold, I'm sure you got to love that. I just mentioned how power play two, Unit two is rarely seen, but PP2's on the ice right now. Nordquist, Lee, Quillen, Lombardi, and Tellier. The Raiders intercept on the four check. A great play by Panetta. Panetta was the goal scorer of this game as it's one nothing with 9.58 remaining in the second period. Quillen moving on in with the puck on the flank, falls to the ice. Lombardi tying it up along the boards to keep possession and it's swung around from Lee to Norquist at the point, but he loses possession and it's out of the zone. 41 seconds trick off the clock. Lee loses the puck, and the Raiders clear. They look for a line change. A great job by Mitten and Stark on the defensive end on the penalty kill for the Raiders. The Colgate Raiders penalty kill, third in the ECAC. Tellier off to Graf. Graf circling, doing work along the end boards. Norquist with it at the point. A pass off to Lipkin, turns, eyes up, sends a pass off the skates of Pearson off to Tellier, who sends a backhand pass to Graf, who can't possess it and can't knock it down. It's cleared out of the zone again by McGuire. Nordquist off to Lipkin, Lipkin up to Graf, who's moving in with speed. Graf cutting to the net, looks for a pass, tries to swing up, but Pearson blocks the pass, a great lane pass protecting play by Pearson. He gets a pass off to DeYoung. DeYoung cutting the net on the backhand and a like save by Guylander. Johnson, a shot from the point, soars over the net. Lipkin on his backhand, twirls a pass off. DeYoung gets possession in the high slot. A pass off to Johnson who can't jam it away, back door, and he's checked by Colton Young. Now he's wrapped up by Bergsland. Bergsland on DeYoung, they battle behind the net. The ref certainly swung the whistle and Colton Young gets trucked by Sky Brindamore. And Colton Young's lying on the ice. He looks certainly hurt as it looked like knee on knee contact and Brindamore will definitely head to the box for that play. Yeah, that's a sure penalty. And it looked like that was almost a hit out of frustration from Brindamore as the Bobcats were really moving the puck well on that one. Just couldn't get anything past Gielander and that doesn't look good. That number 12 there for Colgate Colton Young, he is still laying on the ice in agony. Colton Young, 37 games played, 10 goals, 16 assists, 26 points. Three game-winning goals, two of those in overtime, 30 block shots. He does everything for this program. In the 23 tournament so far, two goals, two assists. He's His junior year, he tied fourth in the ECAC in goals and points, and he was named the program's Offensive Player of the Year against Quinnipiac in the two games this season, zero points, but Colton Young is certainly 
If the stats don't say it enough, he's been a driving force for this team even today. So we'll see if he's able to get to his feet on his own as the injury was to his leg. Brendan Moore at the box right now, and the play is under review currently by the officials and the ECAC conference. Now, someone I want to talk about, Eric, some we haven't touched upon enough tonight in this historic building. Not only the Miracle on Ice, but what this tournament is. The tournament started in 1967, and from 1967 to 92, it was played at Boston Gardens, where the Boston Bruins play. Colton Young now being carried off the ice by his teammates. Yeah, that doesn't look good if you're a Raiders fan. I'd say he's going straight down to the locker room. No, and his brother's still going to be playing Alex Young, so maybe that'll light a fire under him, as that's their top scoring line this season in the Young brothers and Vachon. I'm not sure what they're reviewing. I I'd say, I don't think there's any doubt Brendan Moore is going to be handed a penalty. I think right now it's just a matter of how long. Mm. Maybe what what that penalty will entail, if it's a major, if he's uh, if he's kicked from the arena, which would really be a shame for the Bobcats as well. As we mentioned, he's the defensive forward of the year, named last night, not even 24 hours ago. Well, 826 remain in the second period, and we'll see what happens as the Bobcats have doubled the Raiders Shots on goal, and Brenda Moore yeah, is headed gone. off the ice, so he'll be done tonight. Well, yeah, that's it for Skylar Brenda Moore. That's a huge blow for Quinnipiac, but it's also the hit that he delivered on Colton Young, sending Young down to the locker room, and it looks as though just the way he was unable to put any weight on that leg, it looks as like he's not going to come back. So a huge blow for both teams. Unfortunately, could have been prevented there if that contact didn't happen, but it's a contact sport, and stuff happens sometimes that... It's unfortunate. This is one of those scenarios. and Quinnipiac now down a player, but so is Colgate. So we'll see how both teams respond. Skyler Brindamore yells in anger as he heads off the ice. Very similar to when Corey Perry was suspended from the Winter Classic a few years back for the Dallas Stars. And it will be a five-minute major. So the Colgate Raiders will be on the power play for five minutes now. The Bobcats already down one nothing. Look to kill off a five minute penalty with 8.26 remaining in the second period. Eric, what's the most important part here now that the Bobcats have lost their number one center? Well, right now it's just get out of this power play unscathed. You're unscathed. You're already down by one. You can't let that double. Colgate is a solid team and as good as Quinnipiac is, we've seen that the Raiders have really turned it up this playoffs and especially today in this contest. So if you fall into too big of a hole against this team, it's going to be hard to dig out. So if you're Quinnipiac, any chance you get, clear the puck, get it out. You don't have to worry about the icing because you're down a man. As Colgate wins that opening faceoff, so not a start that Quinnipiac wanted to this penalty kill. Especially with Friedman, another top faceoff man in the East entire conference. He loses the draw now. Anderson controls at the point as they're working through a diamond kite power play structure, 1-3-1, one, one, similar to the Bobcats. Mandeville takes a shot on this block, but it comes out to Anderson. Anderson controlling at the point. Anderson looking, Friedman blocking that lane, and Mandeville takes a shot on the rebound, comes out, and it's cleared out of the zone by the Bobcats. So they'll take some time off the clock and get some fresh lengths as DeYoung comes on, the 2022 defensive forward of the year. On the forecheck against Anderson, coming back into the zone, spins off to cover the two forwards that will be at the point position for the Raiders and the puck comes out of the zone. It's interesting to see how coaches maneuver with the power play now with so much skill and an influx of skill being not only recruited at the college level but NHL level as the Colorado Avalanche at one point this year rolled out their top three defensemen for their power play. But tonight we'll see a lot of forwards on for the Raiders as the Bobcats stand at the Raiders up at the blue line and now Irwin will come back into the zone, pick up the puck, and head north. Irwin weaving through the neutral zone. Cuts in, but he's checked off the puck by Burgard, and it comes out to Mitten. Quillen tied up by Mitten, and the puck's back in the zone. Peretz covering. Looked like an awkward bounce as it almost trickled five on Peretz. And now the Bobcats hold it in their zone, possess, and send the puck out again. 3.26 on the clock on the power play, 6.50 left in the period. This is survival mode, Eric. It really is, especially in the, in the second period, the period of the long change where it takes just a little bit longer for these teams to get to their bench and change players. And when you're on the penalty kill, like I said, any chance they get, just clear the puck. Kill time when you can, but main goal, just get it and rifle it out. Now at the point, Irwin controls and gets a pass off to, I believe, no, my apologies, that's not Stark. That's LaBelle. 
but the puck comes out of the zone. Reed Irwin scored his first NCAA goal in game one, the comeback versus St. Lawrence in their quarterfinal series. The Raiders down 3-0 after two periods and coming all the way back to win 4-3 in overtime. Colton Young with the game winner, so he's off the ice with an injury. Sky Brindamore ejected from the game. If you're just joining us, 5.55 remaining in the second period. Bobcats killing off a five-minute penalty. Two minutes now on the clock, and the Raiders have certainly had their opportunities and Looked good on the power play on their first opportunity in the first period. Anderson chips it off along to Vashon Irwin. My apologies, Verboon. To Anderson who takes a shot and it hits off of Johnson sticking over the net. And Quillen sends the puck out of the zone 200 feet down the ice and a full change for Pecknold's pack. Day Young on the four check, head on a swivel. Looking at which Raiders to pick up as Mitten swings. Gains speed and looks to enter through the neutral zone. Head full of steam, cuts in, Metza breaks it, that play up. McGee on the ice for the Bobcats, battling in the corner. And Metz is getting his stick in there. And a check from De Young. The Bobcats break out three on two on the penalty kill. De Young stopping, a pass across to Friedman, but it hits off his boot and out of play. De Young sending it back into the zone, a smart play to the 49th captain in history, Zach Metza. Metza using his speed to send the puck into the zone around for Friedman to tie it up along the boards. Friedman sends it back all the way back into the Bobcats end, a smart play to kill more time off the clock. Time is the enemy right now for the Bobcats. 109 remaining on the Raiders power play, 433 in the period. A pass comes out to the slot for Vashon, but he fans on it. Graf falling to the ice, Graf not normally on the penalty kill. A shot and Ross and it makes a big block on that shot from the Raiders point man. A hard slap shot's blocked again, Verboon, and a rebound comes out and Graf swings away at it, but he didn't have two hands on the stick. Loses possession and DePaulo has it. DePaulo, a gritty forward for the Raiders, has done due battle and is in in front of the net. Verboon taking a whack at it, but Peretz makes the save. Steady and calm as he's been faced with a few opportunities here on the power play and the pucks hits off of a Colgate Raider forward and out of play. Looks like it'll be a draw in their defensive end as things start to get tight. Not a lot of movement and tough to get passes through for the Raiders in the Bobcats defensive end. Well, that's all. I lost track of the amount of shots that were blocked there by Quinnipiac. That was an amazing sacrifice of all their bodies in, that, in the defensive zone, just keeping Colgate at bay, not letting them get any shots on net. And if they did, it was very low danger. So that was great. I saw a bunch of Bobcats players sprawling on the ice, just doing anything they can to stop a pass, break anything up. And they've done a great job on this penalty kill so far. Just 25 seconds remain on it now. The intensity is very similar to the Disney depiction of the miracle on ice between USA and the Soviet Union at the time. A lot of those players' names in the stands, and you got to think the players that are on the ice right now have probably watched that film a million times and imagine being in this arena right now playing that same game, sacrificing the body to keep the play alive and stay in the game. Philly makes a nice play in the neutral zone. Takes a shot and it's blocked away by Guylander. Guylander, six foot five goaltender. Doesn't take a lot for him to move in that. Lombardi with the puck and Anderson a poke check, knocks it off his stick and now the Raiders come the other way. McGee retrieves, looks up ice and sends a pass off but it's a dump in and an ice on the Bobcats as they all now killed off the five minute power play, a really impressive showing of the Bobcats penalty kill. The face off in there and then 3.08 remaining in the second period. Eric, the penalty kill just occurred. Is this momentum for the Bobcats? It certainly can be because they generated, not only did they stop Colgate from generating much offense on their own power play, Quinnipiac generated offense of their own while down a man during that, that five minute span. So I think this could serve as a potential momentum swing for the Bobcats because they really showed signs of life and, and a lot of it uh, during that five minute penalty kill. Still just three minutes to go in the second period. That's plenty of time to tie this game up and a whole third period on top after this. So if Quinnipiac can keep playing the way they have been the last few minutes, never know what can happen. They're only down by one. Not only that, compared to last season's championship game, the stands are pretty filled in compared to last year. So they're certainly hearing chants from the fans. The pressure's on here in Herbrook's rink in Lake Placid, New York. It's snowing out. 
you got to think it's very similar to February 22nd, 1980. The Bobcats looking to come back even though they are the favorite here. The Colgate Raiders up 1-0. As you mentioned, just a few minutes left here, a couple minutes left in the period, second period of action. And Pinello, the lone goal scorer, is moving down through the neutral zone. Sends a pass off, but it doesn't connect with Raymond as Norquist just checked in the corner by number 18. The Bobcats come away with it. Chenecki Nair doing battle behind the net and a pass off. Joey Cipolo now working on the forecheck. Lipkin on the ice with Chenecki Nair and Graf. Lipkin on the breakout, a pass off to Johnson, a transfer from the RPI Engineers who did not qualify for the tournament this year. So figure as a grad transfer, made the right move coming to the Bobcats program. Graf moving on in, a pass to himself. And it's considered an icing as Stark beats Graf to the puck on that play. And 157 remain, another face off in the Bobcats end. Well, an important one at that too because They've been pretty solid in the faceoff dot tonight, but this is a really important one late in the period. They don't want to give up another late goal like they did in back in the first. If they head to the third period only down by one, I'd count that as a small victory for Quinnipiac considering the five-minute penalty they had to kill off, the two-minute one before that. It's been a tough period for the Bobcats, but they've powered through and still only find themselves down by one and leading in the shot board 17-11. to 11. Certainly getting the shots on goal, but maybe not the quality they'd like as Irwin intercepts and collects the puck in his defensive end. Bergslund's knocked off the puck. Graf possesses Freeman on in, but it's broken up by Guylander. Shades of the 2022 semifinal game. Freeman finished that same chance last year, is broken up by Guylander this year. Experience on his side. And it's dumped into the zone by Pearson. A chip play out. Graf, the long pass. Tries to knock it off to Friedman, who checks Anderson, but the Raiders collect the puck in their defensive end. Lombardi with a head of steam checks Irwin. My apologies, that's Brandon. Brandon with the puck, chips it out of the zone. And the Raiders come in three on two. Circling around, Alex Young off to the point. Anderson, a hard slap shot, and it hits off of a Sean. Vachon did not play in the regular, both regular season games against the Bobcats this season, but has had a strong showing. The goal off to Lombardi, who shoots, and a glove save by Guylander robs Mike Lombardi. Oh, baby, what a save there from Guylander. He read that all the way right into the glove. The catching mitt was there to stop that puck and maintain the shutout for now. What an opportunity there for Lombardi. As I mentioned earlier, I spoke to him yesterday, and he was... He, he sounded extremely determined here to, to right the wrong in his words from last year, and that was a great opportunity for him to tie this game up. But Guy Lander's glove had other ideas. That was a beautiful save. Yeah, Mike Lombardi's a playoff performer. He is a 16-game type player, as they'd refer to the, a player in the NHL. Five points in the ECAC and NCAA tournament last year. One of the goal scorers against Colgate last year. DeYoung a shot, a rebound, and Gowner comes across the crease and robs Sam Lipkin. He's putting on a performance tonight. Graf, a hard slap shot, and it's saved by the blocker of Guylander. Metza off to Lipkin. The Raiders are on the penalty kill right now. We missed that. Eric and I had not informed our listeners that the Bobcats are on the power play. DeYoung in the bumper position. Off to Tellier, who gets a pass off. Bobbled by Guylander. Tellier out to the point. 18 seconds remain. Zach Metza, pass off to Tellier. Tellier holds. Pass. Graf, a slap shot one-timer, but it rolls off his stick. 11 seconds remain. Tellier with the puck below the circles. Moves. Looking for a passing lane. A soft pass to Graf. Three seconds. Two. Graf takes a shot, and it's blocked by Mitten and out of the zone. The Colgate Raiders escape the period with a victory. Guylander putting on a show, and the Bobcats escape the second period after killing off two consecutive power plays, a two-minute, a major. Brenda Moore has been ejected from the game. Raiders lead 1-0 heading into the third period. Eric, what a period to unpack here in Herbrook's rink, the Cathedral of Hockey. Well, I'll tell you what. Colgate owes their netminder, Carter Guylander, dinner after that sequence. What? A sequence of saves there from number 37, the Detroit Red Wings prospect. Oh my goodness, that was, I, there was about three opportunities there. I thought were sure goals for Quinnipiac on the power play, but Guy Lander stopped them all and has kept his team ahead by one. 23 saves on 23 shots for Guy Lander. 
Really remarkable on his part. Eric, a hot goaltender is tough to de defeat, especially in the postseason, right? It's like a bowling ball downhill. Carter Guylander, he in the 23 tournament so far, so this year's ECAC tournament, eight goals against but 80 saves coming into this game. He has a zero on the board, so 23 more. Add that to his 80 saves tonight. He's at 103 saves, a 915 save percentage, and in the three games played at 239 goals against in all three games. So great numbers, great math. Like if you're a math person, you love to see those numbers across the board. And if you're watching the game on television and you're listening live, you know that he just put on a performance to keep the game at one nothing. We'll be back in 15 minutes for the third period of action as the Bobcats fight for their season and for the White Law Championship bid. And the Raiders lead one nothing in what could be considered a small miracle for the Dark Horse. You're back with the Quinnipiac Bobcats Sports Network. I'm Matthew Mugno with Eric Zank. We are in Lake Placid, Herb Brooks Rink, and we are covering the ECAC semifinal match between the Quinnipiac Bobcats versus the Colgate Raiders. The Colgate Raiders doing the unthinkable, up one nothing on the Hamden heavyweights. Heading into the third period of action, puck drop set for one minute and 15 seconds. Eric, it looks like a mini miracle on ice could occur, but the Bobcats are up on the power play, the man advantage, five on four to start the period. What do they need to do to get back in this game and stave off the scares of losing in the semifinal to the Raiders? They have to stick with what they were doing to close out the period. Even during their five minute penalty kill, they showed signs of life, they showed signs of, of offensive, really offensive execution for the first time all game long. And then as that penalty expired, they went on the power play of their own, and they had three golden opportunities all in the span of 30 seconds to even this game up. Couldn't do it because of just excellent goaltending by Carter Gielander for Colgate. But if they stick to how they played to close out that period and they keep doing the little things right, moving the puck, opening up lanes, getting Colgate players out of their position, I think they'll find themselves in a, in a great spot to tie this game up. Still 20 minutes to go, but as you mentioned, potentially 20 minutes away from what we could consider a minor miracle. Colgate, the underdog here against Quinnipiac, the heavy favorite in this one. The dark horse up one nothing. They'll put out their top scoring line against the Bobcats top scoring line. It looks like Lipkin, Graf, and Day Young will take the ice with Metza and Tellier for the power play. Peretz in net. Guylander getting set up in his end. And for the penalty kill, we got Brandon, Colton Young, Mitten, and Bergsland for the Raiders. Now, something else to point out. Skylar Brindamore, we got the stat sheet from Patrick Kramer. Thanks, Patrick, for giving us all the info from Go Bobcats. Skylar Brindamore had 14 faceoff wins and five losses, so he was winning faceoffs at 73%. Talk about the top faceoff man in the ECAC now ejected from the match. Metza loses the puck at his feet, recollects, and they set up Graf in over the blue line. Possessing eyes up, chip off the wall to Metza. Metza walking to the middle of the ice, takes a slap shot, and it hits off of Colton Young, but the puck comes out to Graf. Graf sends a pass across to Tellier, but he can't collect, and it comes out of the zone. Graf with the puck, spins off a check from Mitten. Graf. Turns to the inside of the ice and gets a pass off to Metza, who advances. Off to De Young over the blue line, gains the offensive zone. Gains the blue line, Mitten with the puck, gets it off to Young. Young moving on in, on the ice, takes a shot and it's a pad save. Colton Young is back on the ice for the Raiders. Looked like he was down and out after that injury, but he just had a breakaway opportunity to start the period. Now De Young doing battle, Graf gets the puck, bobbles the puck in, Irwin chips it off the glass in his own end. He's tangled up by Panetta, the goal scorer. Well, that was almost an off the floor on the board situation like Paul Correa back in 03, but luckily the, for Quinnipiac, the defense there of Colin Graff really taking away the position of Young to prevent anything from happening there. Peretz was able to get the pad out. Last line of defense able to make the play. Filling in just corrals the puck enough to get it away from Vachon for a sure two on one in zone play. Lombardi can't handle the puck on the blue line and the puck comes back into his end. Now Nordquist has to move the puck. Vashon in on top of Nordquist. They were tangled up on the ice. Quillen comes away with it. The center moving it to Lombardi at the wing. Power plays over for the Bobcats and the Raiders are at full strength. A chip play around the boards. 
Comes to Young. Alex Young gets the puck into the slot. Lego sends it off to Lee. Lee winding up, takes the shot, and it goes, and it's blocked into the netting by Young. The Young brothers all over the ice to start the third period, Eric. Well, the Bobcats are going to have to be careful here because just like last period, we mentioned a big kill by Quinnipiac. Turn the tide a little bit, change the momentum in favor of the Bobcats. Now, they're going to have to be careful as Cornell just killed off a huge penalty of their own. And don't think that they didn't generate some confidence, some momentum from that now. Already ahead by one. A shot from Desi Burgard, who is on the ice for the Bobcats. This is the most ice time he's seen since that Sacred Heart game in the CT Ice Tournament on January 27th. And it's an icing play. We'll have a face-off to the right of Guylander. Guylander has not been challenged too much tonight by the Bobcats. He definitely made a spree of saves at the end of the second period on the power play. But at 5-on-5 five five even strength, Bobcats have had a tough time getting to the middle of the ice. They really have. The majority of their shots tonight have been from behind the, the face-off circles. Not exactly prime spot, prime positions to score goals in. Only a few here, according to the shot chart, have been anywhere near the, the goalie crease. So Quinnipiac, again, it's been the story of the game. They're going to have to find ways to get down low and get quality chances from high danger areas, which they've really struggled to do all night long. They go, takes a shot, but it's blocked by Verboon, who looks like he's missing a skate blade as he's struggling to get to the bench, and he chirps Fillion on the bench as he heads to his bench. They're still going at it as they're in the bench. Colton Young moving on in, takes a shot, and it's saved by Peretz on the five hole, and the puck's chipped away. Colton Young takes another whack, and it goes wide of the net. Colton Young's been all over the ice, playing with a vengeance. Colgate Raiders up 1-0 here in the third period. The Bobcats fighting for their lives as they've lost two consecutive White Law Championship games. First to St. Lawrence, 3-2 in overtime. Last year to the Harvard Crimson, 3-2 in overtime as well. They're looking for their third bid and for a chance to win it. They have to get out of the semifinal game in order to do so. Chinecki and Air moving on in, takes a wrister off his toe, and it misses the top shelf. And the puck comes out of the zone. Norquist kicks it to McGee. McGee chips it into the offensive zone. McGee, a utility skater, has played shifts tonight alone at defense and forward on some shifts going from one to another in rapid succession. Eric, third period start off with a bang. Colton Young has played well, but Raymond's going to the box for the Raiders as it looks like he took a penalty on that play. An infraction slowed down the play. And the Bobcats will be on the power play now. Maybe a swing in momentum for them. Yeah, well, we've seen a lot of penalties tonight, and none of them have been uh, successful power plays so far for Quinnipiac. They have another opportunity here for the next two minutes. But don't think, as on the topic of, of Colton Young coming back, don't think he doesn't know that Brindamore is still watching this thing from the back. And Colton Young's been flying around the ice to start this game, and he would love nothing more to get on the board after that incidental collision that he took in the second period. Metza and Graf try and look for shooting lanes, but it's blocked by the Raiders. Mitten notably. Tellier has replaced Brindamore's spot and plays on the left weak side flank. Gets it off to Metza. Metza off to Graf, who has a lot of space. The pass off. De Young takes the shot. The rebound goes in. The Bobcats score. Ethan De Young swings the puck in on net. And it looked like Lipkin either tapped it in or it trickled on by. Three defenders in the crease with Guylander. The game is tied. Eric Zank. Your call for the player to watch has registered a goal to tie the game four minutes in on the power play. It's a power play goal. Well, that's what we've been waiting for all night long from the Bobcats. I said earlier they got to start crashing the net, get some dirty goals. That one's not going to show up on a top 10 highlight reel, but it doesn't matter. It crosses the line. It counts. This game is tied. So like you, as you mentioned, three Bobcats in the crease, and that's what they had to do to beat Guylander. You weren't going to be able to beat him clean from a wrist shot from the circle or from the blue line, you're gonna have to crash the net and get one of those greasy goals. And they got one now, and it's a brand new hockey game. And now the pendulum swings as the Bobcats have some jump to their game in the offensive zone. They won the draw center ice, to pass off to Norquist who takes a shot and it's saved by Guylander. Possibly a block from Colton Young as he chips it out. And a play to his brother, moving on in. But he's checked off the puck hard by Johnson who throws for Boone. The net gets knocked off. Alex Young and Norquist tied up, Peretz under the net. Looking like a turtle, looked like he got hit by the net as he skates out his water bottle at mid ice. And McGee's tangled up there as well as some after play uh, extracurricular activity occurs, Eric. I think the refs are going to earn their money in these next 15:43 <laughs> because this game is not going to settle down in any right. This is now a tie hockey game 
It's going to get, it's already been physical. We saw that hit just ended up with the net falling on top of goaltender Yaniv Peretz. If that's any inkling to what we're going to see for the next three quarters of a period, buckle up. And it's a new game now. It's 1-1. The Bobcats have tied the game on the power play. Third period of action, 15 minutes remain. So we are hardly through this third frame. A tie game now, new life, new game. And the puck's chipped into the zone. A metamorphosis from what we've seen from the Bobcats in the first period. Legault with the puck, cruising on in. Chips it off the boards to Cipollone. The Italian stallion off to Legault. Legault swings at it. Keeps it in the zone as LaBelle tries to move the puck in advance out of the zone. LaBelle coming away with it again on the breakout. Loses the puck to Legault's feet, and it comes back into the Bobcats end, trickling in. The Glassman line now out for the Raiders. Glassman, Panetta, and LaBelle doing a great job as they recorded the team's first goal. A shot from the point, and Peretz makes a big glove save through traffic, and a rebound squeaks out. Glassman takes a whack in the slot, but Peretz comes up with the save and stands tall. Peretz outside of the net, controlling, sticks it away to Rossinen. And Vachon's taken down by Rossinen. It looked like that could have been interference behind the play, but the refs, as you mentioned, earning their pay, swallow the whistle there. Quillen whacking on Belpito, who's rubbed hard into the boards. Looks like he was hurt on that play. Not severely, but shaken up, certainly. Lipkin in with the York Hill boys line of Quillen, Graf, and Lipkin, who have hardly been united because of all the lineup changes the Skylar Brindamore play, the penalty kill, and the power plays that have occurred. The Bobcats' most productive line is now back at work. Quillen taken down. Chips off a of Lipkin, sticking out of play. Vachon sends a pass for Colton Young, as you mentioned, playing with a vengeance. A fire under him after taking a knee on knee hit. He's returned to the ice and been flying around. Metzel with the puck, power play quarterback for the Bobcats, 49th captain in team history. And a shot from Lipkin <clears throat> goes all the way into the zone. Gylander gloves it down and he sends it in for Stark to start play for the Raiders. The Raiders advancing, it hits off a mitten, and Tellier comes away with it. De Young playing with some prowess, moving on in, puck on his forehand, he gets checked into the boards, double teamed by Pearson and Stark. Tellier up the boards to Norquist, a chip play, finds Tellier in the slot, and a one-timer from De Young right to the crest of Carter Gylander who makes the stop. A big goaltender duel going down in this 1-1 match in the wild, wild west. Actually north in Lake Placid here, Eric. Yeah, it's north, but it doesn't have a good enough ring to it. So this has been a heck of a game. Night and day for Quinnipiac from the first to the third period. They're generating chances left and right now to start this uh, final regulation frame. Only one goal to show for it, but they have been all over the place. And so is Colgate. They have still had their fair share of opportunities in their offensive zone. And as you mentioned, this period has been a goaltending duel. I mean, most of the game has, but I think that the rest of the game, the rest of this matchup is going to be, it's going to come down to goaltending, no doubt. And both goaltenders have been quick to draw, have come up big for their respective programs as it's a 1-1 game, 26 shots for the Bobcats, 19 for the Raiders, yet only one stand on the scoreboard for each side and each offense. De Young with not the prettiest goal to tie the game up on the power play and a beauty from the Raiders in the first period. Now Joey Cipolo moving on in. A rebound comes out. Freeman bobbles the puck and Lombardi can't come away with it right in front of the net as the screen. Joey Cipolo with it behind the net again. In Gretzky's office looking to set up. Pass it off to Lombardi who loses it. Gets it in front. Friedman whacks away but now the Raiders come away with it. The Raiders send it into the offensive zone. Raymond with the play to get the puck out for the change. Glassman on the forecheck, number 20 for the Raiders, has been flying all night, has had a few great looks for his team from Hamilton, New York. Despite the fact that they're in the same state, it still took them three hours to get here the other day for their open practice. Yesterday, morning and afternoon, Eric was in attendance for that. Metza moving up ice now, has a lot of space and time to make a play. Metza on his forehand, cuts to the slot. At the top of the circles, takes a shot, and it's blocked away by Colton Young into the netting, and we'll have a faceoff. Well, that was one of those plays there where Colgate was just in all the right positions, and that shot right off the stick of a Colgate defenseman and into the net. So, again, Quinnipiac, although they've been generating chances, they have to keep sticking to what worked for them, crashing the net, shooting for rebounds. 
because that play right there, a shot from the slot, even though it was a nice play, he dangled through some defensemen. That's not going to get you much of anywhere against this Colgate team. Metza off the draw, takes a one-timer, but he missed the pulling the trigger on it. It fell off his stick. Lee gets the puck out of the zone, and they'll reset as the Colgate Raiders look in transition. Hit Verboon, moving on in. Cuts to the slot, takes the shot. The rebound comes out, whacking away at it. It comes out of the crease, and it was still loose, but the puck comes out. Graf whacked away to get it out of the crease as Peretz was knocked into the net by Mitten, and the play's blown dead. Peretz looks to be okay as there was a pile up in the crease. He made the save, the puck squeaked out. Graf whacked it out of the crease, but they blew the whistle probably because the officials lost sight of it. Yeah, I, I mean, all of it, so did I until it shot out to the boards and by then the whistle had blown already. So I, that kind of reminded me of the play towards the end of the second period there where the puck went into the, the, the crease. It was like a pinball and players, probably about five or six of them just all piled into the crease trying to, half of them trying to get it out and half of them just trying to jam it across that red line. Peretz, the nation's best, has certainly been challenged on his rebound control today as he's bobbled a few uh, that of opportunities that weren't clean looks from the Raiders. Uh, he, he certainly had his work cut out for him, as we mentioned, both goaltenders have. Johnson doing a good job collecting with pace to get the puck back into the offensive zone. Chinecki Nair spins off a check to set up in the offensive zone and get the even strength play going. A pass sent across and the puck's chipped over and out of play by Alex Young and we'll have a face off in the neutral zone. The Young brothers have come to play. The Bobcats, we have yet to see a lot of Graf, Lipkin, and Quillen, the York Hill boys from Quinnipiac of the Hamden heavyweights donning the gold. Have not been united a lot tonight, but we certainly have seen a lot of work from Friedman, Lombardi, and Cipollone who are taking the ice right now at center ice for the draw. Yeah, sometimes when you're the coach in a game like this, you tend to sometimes mix lines up, play certain lines more than others that you might not in, in other games. And that's just to see what works. Sometimes if, you know, obviously Quinnipiac didn't have the greatest first two periods, and that might just be Rand Pecknell just trying to get something, stir something up and light some sort of fire under this team. Activate his assets. Rossin and in, collecting, sending up the boards to Lombardi. Lombardi's checked off by Anderson. My apologies, that's Bergsland, and he's buried into the boards, and it looks like we'll have a face-off as Rossin landed on top of the puck. Now, Cipollone, Friedman, and Lombardi play that style of play. That's their brand, physical, sandpaper, forecheck, get the puck in deep, force the defenseman to turn their skates toward the net to get there first, and that's what can win you playoff games. That's right. That's what the playoffs are all about, defense and physicality and score when you can, and that's why Quinnipiac has gotten to the point where they are especially that line, like is, as you mentioned, extremely physical and a huge reason they've gotten back into this one. And a rebound comes out as Peretz had a tough time gloving it down and it popped out of his glove and there was a chance in front for Glassman to finish, but he could not. Glassman takes a shot just wide as it wisps by the crease of Peretz. And Metz are doing work. And a wraparound attempt is stuffed by Peretz, doing a great job fending off this offensive zone attack from the Raiders. And a high stick from Friedman forced the puck back into their defensive end. Metza and this line will face off again against the Raiders. Friedman, a Missouri native, was done a great job in the face-off dot, and he's a player, along with Lombardi, they both registered goals in the 2022 semifinal against the Colgate Raiders in a three-to-one victory. So they know what it takes to beat this team as they are tied in a 1-1 match that's seen certainly a roller coaster of action so far. If you're just joining us, it's 1-1. 10.30 remaining in Lake Placid. The Rink of Miracles, Herb Brooks Rink. Lake Placid, New York, Quinnipiac Bobcats in the semifinal against the Colgate Raiders here on QBSN. Matthew Mugno, Eric Zank on the call. Verboon comes away with it, sends a pass to Min, who's streaking on in. He makes a move, and it's broken up by Jaden Lee, who is one-on-one -on -one defending him in the slot. Min with the puck. Still moving with it, not checked off the puck, takes a shot, and it looked to be tipped by Verboon. The Swiss Army Knife, the Switzerland native, couldn't come away with it. Verboon with the puck, sends a pass, but it hits off Lipkin's knee pad and back into his zone. Verboon, below the dot, sends a pass off to the point, and a pass sent off to nobody from Anderson as the puck is intercepted. Lipkin in on the forecheck now, the first man in, doing the good work. Ties up Anderson in the corner. Quillen jamming away. The center trying to get the puck as the York Hill boys line is out for the Bobcats. Quillen trying to spin away with it. 
gets tied up with Alex Young, but the puck comes out, and Legault gets checked hard into his own boards. The puck circles around, Guylander possessing, gets the puck past Quillen, who's hard on the forecheck, and the puck comes out, but Legault tries to pinch, his stick breaks, Rossinen in his own end to recollect, sends the puck up boards, and now they have numbers going north. Colin Graf moving on in, cuts to the net, feeds himself, takes a shot, and Gallander makes a beautiful save on Graf, who gets checked hard into the boards following that play. A beautiful play. We saw him score a goal against Harvard on January 6th on a similar play earlier this season. Bergslund to the net, tries to find a tip, and Johnson rubs out. Raymond, Lipkin with the puck, head up to Nordquist. Nordquist lofts one. Tries to hit Quillen on the outlet, but it looks to be an icing on that play. And it's not as Quillen beat that icing, but he looks for the change. Pearson off to Bergslund. Bergslund dumps it in. We haven't seen much of Manderville, but he's on the ice currently for the Raiders. Manderville, six foot five, a big body. His father played with Rod Brindamore on the Flyers, and the puck's intercepted, and a shot is blocked by Johnson over the net as McGuire had all the time in the world to take a quality shot in the slot on a turnover from the Bobcats as well of a whistle and a timeout. Well, that was a brutal and almost costly turnover there by the Bobcats. That was Nordquist, I believe, that turned that one over. That was close for Colgate, and luckily the defense of, of Quinnipiac was able to get there, block the shot, and send it in to the netting to negate any threat there. But Quinnipiac, for the last few minutes, I feel, have, have really been on their heels. They really haven't been able to generate much in their own zone. It's been a back and forth period, but for, for the most part, I feel like Colgate has really been sustaining pressure and has, like I said, really put the Bobcats on their heels the last five or six minutes or so. And, and Quinnipiac's going to have to turn this around and tilt the ice back in the other direction as time's starting to run out and the next goal could potentially be the difference. This is anyone's game. 8-16 remain in the period. The shot clock registers 27 for the Bobcats, 21 for the Raiders. But it's a 0-0 game. And that's how both teams have played. There's been pace, there's been intensity. We've seen the graduates and seniors taking a lot of the ice time. And Colton Young back on the ice for the Raiders, one of their best players after Brendan Moore taking that penalty. A sloppy second period from both sides leads us to a third period full of action in the first half. Any of these guys on the ice tonight in the rink of miracles could score the game winner. Last year, it was a three to one game. The Bobcats had kind of taken control before the Raiders got back into it and Wyatt Bongiovanni iced it with a third goal on a break in opportunity. And tonight it is a one one game. Looks like no side is favored here as play picks up Yanni Peretz. Face off to his left, Friedman taking the draw. Lee and Metza, the defensive partners. Metza recollects, circles the net, chips it off the glass to try and get the puck out as DeYoung shoved from behind. Lombardi with the puck over the blue line but can't possess as the puck comes out to DePaulo. DePaulo pumps the brakes. Sends a pass for Verboon, back door on a stretch. DeYoung tries a chip play. He turns it over at the blue line. DeYoung another chip play to Lombardi. They come away with the puck. De Young, cutting through the neutral zone, on his forehand, to his backhand, cuts to the net, on the backhand, tries a wrap around. On his forehand, dips it off to Metza. Metza can't collect and bobble it down, and now Metza and Lee recollect in transition. Lee with the puck, sends it to Lombardi, and it's into the offensive zone. But the Raiders play pass and catch, and now Panetta cuts through the neutral zone. Number 11 for the Raiders, moving on in. The goal scorer for them tonight. A shot from the point from Bergsland goes wide. Tellier in position for Brindamore on that line. The puck's turned over at the point by Fillion. And Johnson does a great job standing up the play at the top of the circle on defense to get the puck off to Chenekinair. Chenekinair taken down by Panetta and shoved into the corner. Glassman with the puck circles in his own zone on the outlet. Hits Panetta, streaking up the middle of the ice. Takes a slap shot and it goes into the netting on a block and the Faceoff should be in the neutral zone towards the Bobcat bench. Yeah, that was just another example of back and forth hockey and almost a Hail Mary shot there from the blue line. A slapper that was just nicked by a stick of a Bobcat went into the netting. And as you mentioned, faceoff now just outside the Quinnipiac zone. 6.59 to go in the third in the tie game. 
As you mentioned, time is ticking away, but the intensity has picked up and is mounting. You could feel it in the building. There are plenty of fans here representing both the Bobcats and the Raiders. Great to see in comparison from last year's tournament that whether it was COVID affected, the winter conditions, the seats were empty. Tonight, we're hearing chants from the crowd after penalties and power play opportunities and saves. Pucks tied up in the corner. McGee and Fillion going to work. My apologies, that's Desi Burgard. The Raiders come away with the puck, try and send a pass, but Burgard loses his stick. Jaden Lee open on a backdoor feed from Friedman, but the play is broken up by a Colgate defender, Vachon. Quillen has the puck, tries to carry it in himself, but it's broken up and taken away by Irwin. Irwin to Stark. Stark dumps it all the way in and it'll be an icing. The Bobcats will have a face-off opportunity in the offensive zone with 6.01 remaining. And they keep the Yorktown, my apologies, the York Hill boys together. Graf, Lipkin, and Quillen will be in the offensive end with Metza and Johnson at the point. Johnson had the game-winning goal in the CT Ice Championship game to seal the deal and afford it winning four to three, and he scored that goal three with three minutes remaining in the game. So he does have a game winner within the final minutes of a game under his belt this season. Yeah, he's got a knack for late dramatic goals, as he just mentioned. This game is still any one of these teams' games to, to lose or to win. 1-1 now with almost five and a half remaining, and neither team really showing signs of, of being better than the other. It's really even right now. Metza turned the puck over in the offensive zone and Mitten had a great chance on that. And another shot from Brandon at the point is gloved down by Peretz, but he can't stop it and hold it. Mitten going to work again. Checks Graf. The shot comes out to Raymond. Mitten in the slot. Makes a move. Deeks takes a shot, but whiffs off his heel as he looked to create space for himself. Brandon off to Bergsland, Bergsland chips it into the zone to get to work and it comes out to Raymond. Raymond dishes in front to nobody on a blind pass and Metza comes away with the puck cruising through the neutral zone, tries to hit Lipkin on an outlet, the Lafayette Hill native checked by Bergsland as he's still working in the offensive zone. Day Young doing battle and a whistle's blown. Most likely a tie up play. Lipkin's down, a little bit slow to get up on that play. Not sure if the whistle blown is for a penalty if it's just for a stoppage because the puck was under them, but we shall see in one moment. Eric, the Bobcats, they've deployed a myriad of forwards. Lipkin's coming to the bench right now and he's okay. And right now they will deploy De Young, Cipollone, and Lombardi. Lombardi set up for a one-timer at the top of the circle, left shot, left-handed shot at the left circle, but the Bobcats lose the draw. Cipollone beat on the boards battle. And Lombardi comes away with it at the point. Cruising on in. He takes a shot, and it's blockered down by Guylander behind the net. Rossinen takes a whack to break up a play and recollects. Eyes up, he goes for an outlet, and DeYoung knocks it down. Could have been an icing if he hadn't. Peretz controls with Verboon forechecking. He takes the draw to his right. Four minutes left in the, four minutes, 28 seconds remaining in the third period here, Eric, and the pressure is mounting for both teams to capitalize on an opportunity. Oh yeah, and both defenses have really tightened up these last five minutes or so. Similar to, I'll compare it to baseball, no doubles defense late in the game. You don't want to give up a big hit that could cost you a run. Right now, both teams in this game are just playing really, really tight-knit defense, not really worrying about the offensive side of the puck right now. It's just prevent the other team from scoring and maybe just force overtime, get out of this thing tied up. Desi Burgart's checked hard into the boards and as McGee tries to collect it, bounces in to the Colgate Raiders bench. As you mentioned with baseball, with defense and how that's played in another sport, it's similar to football as well with the run game. You don't wanna pass the ball or send a Hail Mary and end up having the puck come the other way on a broken opportunity or on a rush play, a, an odd man rush. So the Bobcats take the draw with the Raiders. Colton Young taking the draw against Chinecki in air, and the Raiders come away with it. On a send pass, Johnson comes away with the puck in his own end, chips it off the boards. Colton Young does battle with Fillion. Johnson sends it on a one-time 
One touch pass to Lee. Lee sends it into the zone. De Young swings around. Fillion off to Chinecki and Aaron front, but the puck rolls off his stick. Fillion doing battle with Bergsland. Fillion gets it off to De Young. De Young using his body to edge out Colton Young. A shot from Johnson from the point hits off of the skate of Pearson. And Fillion collects below the circles. Fillion with the puck turns away towards the boards. Pins it along the boards for some help. Chinecki and Aaron there doing battle. Getting his stick in there. Fillion with De Young. De Young circling the net. Has the puck on his stick. Sends it out in front. Metza with the shot from the point and it goes wide. And Chinecki and Aaron fights for the puck. Gets the free battle to the side of the net and gets it off to Metz at the point. Chinecki Nair tries to play it to himself through his legs, but it's broken up and De Young comes away with it. De Young in Gretzky's office sends it off to Rossinen. Rossinen to Metz. Tries to shake a defender who's all over him. Ran out of space, takes a shot, and it's blocked by, by Vashon. A shot from Metz gets swallowed up by Bergslin, who looks for the outlet. And here come the Young brothers. Alex moving on in. Finds Raymond who takes a shot and it's blocked by Metz and goes wide and now the Bobcats swing around and look for the outlet on a rush play. Cipollone on his backhand chips it into the zone. The Raiders break it up and Raymond comes out. Raymond trying to distribute for his center, Menderville. But Rossening comes away with the puck. Cipollone cuts to the middle, whiffs on the shot. Freeman a shot, goes over the net on a good look as he tried to beat Geilander top shelf. 2-14, tick away in a 1-1 game. The Bobcats at 28 shots, one goal to show for it. A send pass from Johnson, a risky play. Batelier gets the puck on in and he goes for the change as Graf Quillen and the York Hill boys take the ice. Nordquist coming back to play defense. He's checked off the puck, but Lipkin comes in in support on a back check and Nordquist corrals the puck behind his net. On the four check, Verboon did a good job to try and shake Nordquist, but he sends it back to his partner, Johnson. Johnson, with 140 remaining in the third period of action, sends it around. The York Hill boys on the ice for the Bobcats doing battle as Lipkin trips over his teammate Quon and is now far behind on a back check. Lee slaps it off his own boards to try and hit Graf on an outlet, but misses and now Quillen's moving on in. Sends for Lipkin, but the pass is broken up on a great defensive play by Anderson. A mouthful there as there was back and forth action. 119 tick off the clock as both teams make a change. Yeah, well, last time we saw a stoppage in play, I said how it was a defensively tightly knit game. But since I said that, it's really opened up and Quinnipiac has generated a ton of opportunities. A lot of them high, high quality as his third period Start, starts to come to a close here. And now the faceoff. Friedman loses it, but it comes out to Metza. It's picked up by Young. Colton, that is. The player that we thought would be injured for the rest of this game has some jump, has been electric in this third period. Four checking on Lombardi, who chokes the puck up and a shot off of Perrette's shoulder, but it goes wide. And another shot from the point hits Perrette's glove and he keeps it down for a faceoff to his left, his glove side on a great push by the Raiders on the forecheck to force the turnover. Uh, well, the Bobcats have to be careful here. A goal, if they would let up a goal now, 57 seconds to go, that could be the nail in the coffin with not much time left. So Quinnipiac's gonna have to be careful. That was a little bit of a, def a defensive mishap there by the Bobcats. So they gotta win this face off. They got Friedman at the dot there. Within the final minute of the third period, we have a 1-1 game. Will we see a miracle happen in the next 57 seconds? Johnson comes away with the puck, sends it north for Burgart, and De Young's in on the forecheck. Spins off of Irwin, and Berg Burgart gets tripped up. The Bobcats bench jumping up to see if there would be a call. Burgart with the puck, tries to get it in front, and the Crimson, my apologies, not the Crimson, the Raiders come away with the puck. Pinello. Tries to set a pass off, but it's broken up by Quon, and now De Young's in. De Young off to Burgart, but he misses on the play. 26, ticking off the clock. Peretz, oh, fumbles the puck, and it comes out in front, and he just bobbles it and covers it as Menderville took a whack. Smart move, cover that puck. That was that took a weird bounce off the end wall, and I don't even think Peretz expected to have to cover that one. He 
looked like his intention was to just leave it for his defenseman to come get it and start a four check, one final rush, but he ended up having to cover it and a faceoff will be to the right of Peretz now. 22 seconds remain on the clock in a tie game here in the third period. Quinnipiac one, Colgate one, Friedman in the dot facing off against DePaulo. DePaulo wins the draw and Graf makes the defensive play, but a shot comes out and Peretz makes a huge save, covering up the five hole, protecting the wickets. Now Verboon's hard on the four check. Friedman chips the puck off the glass and it goes out of play as all the fans in the crowd cover their head. It went way up into the sky towards the jerseys that hang, showing us how many tournament championships each ECAC team has. Another draw looking like it will be to the left of Yanni Peretz. The York Hill boys line is on in Lipkin Graf. And we have Friedman centering those two with Rossinen and Metza playing defense. Well, this is the biggest face off of the game. 9.2 seconds to go. If Colgate wins the draw, they set up a four check and have nine seconds to get a shot off to potentially win this thing. Quinnipiac, if they win it, which they do, it's one back. The Bobcats win time. it in a scramble. Two seconds tick off the clock. And one, the play's broken up by Graf, and we'll head to overtime as the Quinnipiac Bobcats and Colgate Raiders are tied in the ECAC semifinal match for a bid to play in the White Law Championship. Eric Zank, Matt Mugna on the QBSN call. We will be back. I'm unsure of how much time is actually in between cur the current period, the end of the third period, and overtime looks to be 15 minutes. We'll, we will be back in 15 minutes for overtime action. In what most American residents would consider the cathedral of hockey in the United States of America, the Quinnipiac Bobcats are facing the Colgate Raiders in sudden death overtime, puck drop in 126. The score was tied 1-1. They head to overtime after intense action in the third period, the Bobcats tying it on an Ethan Day Young goal on the power play. Eric, the Bobcats have a tough history in overtime in the playoffs the last two years, losing in the ECAC White Law Championship game in overtime to the St. Lawrence Saints and the Harvard Crimson. They now enter a semifinal in overtime, a match that the Raiders were the dark horse. What does each side need to do to win this game in overtime? Well, Quinnipiac's got to buckle down defensively. I, I felt like they started to let Cor uh, Colgate back in the game towards the end of that period. If we look at the shot board, Colgate has caught up. The shots are now 30 to 29 in favor of the Bobcats, and that's one thing that they've had the advantage in all game long, and now Colgate's really pulled in. They've turned it up offensively. They've kept Quinnipiac at bay for the most part, and the chances that the Bobcats have generated, there's been some high, high danger, but for the most part, they've been from the perimeter. And for Colgate, it's pretty much just sticking to the same routine. They came in here with a chip on their shoulder. As the underdog, they wanted to prove everyone wrong. And so far, we're going to overtime here. They've done a pretty good job at that. So both teams just have to stick to what they've been doing right all season long, and that is tight checking, defense first, score when you can. But obviously, overtime, whoever scores next wins the game. One goal game. It's a golden goal game in the building of miracles. The face-off set. Quillen, Graf, and Lipkin. The York Hill boys line on with Metza and Johnson. The graduate defensive pairing up against the Ross Minton, Alex DiPaolo, Matt Verboon line. And the Bobcats break out. A chip off the boards to Graf. And Bergsland comes away with it. Tommy Bergsland circles the boards. Johnson chips it back into the zone. A start of four check. Islander misplaying the puck. Graf gets to it first. Quillen chips it behind the net of Guylander and Grafson on the four check gets there first. He's surrounded by Mitten and Bergsland. Graf getting to the puck again on Irwin. Chips it to Quillen, his line mate. Quillen, the center, checked off the puck and Lipkin tries to get it to the point to the Metza, but he's also checked by Irwin. Verboon gets the puck out of the zone and the Bobcats retreat going for a line change. Now Friedman and Lombardi look to come on as there's an icing, the face off to the left of Guylander. So far, I see a lot of similarities to how this game has gone. We've seen a lot in this game. Goals, penalties, ejections, so why not overtime? <laughs> and Everything's happened here in this game, right, Eric? Oh, yeah, too much to keep track of. Friedman will face off against Apollo in the center. 
dot. The Raiders have struggled on the faceoff dot, but so is Friedman. A normally strong faceoff man for the Bobcats at the end of the third period was two for five in the faceoff dot. Lombardi takes a shot and it's blocker down by Guylander. Look like he's stuck to his blocker and the Raiders chip it into the offensive zone, but it'll look to be another icing. Lombardi with a great one-time opportunity off the draw. Looked like he could have beaten Guylander. It certainly could have, but the way Guy Lander has been playing tonight, we've seen it's going to be extremely difficult to beat him. The one time Quinnipiac did tonight was when there were three players in the crease just crash in the net, and they were able to poke one by him. So they're going to have to most likely do something very similar to that play if they're going to score in this overtime because Guy Lander has been rock solid. A great win by Friedman again to win it off to Lombardi, who circled around the top of the left dot. And a shot from the point from Friedman gets tied up in Irwin skates and the Raiders clear the puck out again. The Raiders having a little bit of a difficult time setting up any offensive flow. Lombardi with the puck on his forehand, takes a shot and it just goes wide of the rebound. Kylander makes a diving save. The puck's still to the side of the net and now the Raiders are coming in. Colton Young with the puck, tries to take a shot and it's tied up and a pass off to Bergslund. Bergslund. Tries to chip it into the zone, but Nordquist comes away with it to fill in along the sideboards. Guylander made a Brayden Hopey like stick save at the goal mouth, and now the Bobcats come the other way. Joey Cipollone on net, filling with it behind the net now as a corral to the side. And Anderson retrieves it for the Raiders as they regroup off the boards to Alex Young. Swings, swivels, and sends it into the zone, but it'll be another icing as he was below his side of the red line. So the Bobcats will have another draw. Well, Matt, I have no idea how this game is still going on. I thought for sure that puck was bound across the goal line. Guy Lander was down and it appeared he was out, but next thing we knew the puck was cleared halfway down the ice and play continued on. It, it is remarkable. The saves, the high caliber saves not just the quantity, but just the quality of the saves that Guy Lander has made tonight, and that one just adds to that total. Tellier retrieves it in the neutral zone. The Bobcats had lost to draw, and it came all the way around the boards, as it does again. Tellier battling with Vachon, and Anderson moving with the puck to mobilize. He gets it out, and Young takes a shot on that. Perrette swallows it and gets it off to Metza. Metza hits Day Young, who's waiting in the neutral zone. Day Young. A soft chip for Tellier who gets there first. Battles, Day Young tries to get it off his stick, but can't. And it comes out to Metsu who stands up the red line. Day Young on his backhand, feathers it into the zone, but McGee can't come away with it, and Anthony Stark has the puck. Sends it off to Raymond, but he's tied up by Johnson and knocked off the puck. Metsa, a stretch pass, hits off Tellier's stick, he gets it into the offensive zone, and McGee's in on the forecheck, but that line goes for a full change as Bergard comes in now. The Raiders look to jump quick as the Bobcats make a line change, and they dump it into the offensive zone. Peretz opts not to play it. Lego on his forehand, comes out to the point. Bergsland winds, shoots, and it's blocked away. McGee with the puck, chips it off the glass, and it's stopped by Bergsland again. Peretz covering the puck, and there'll be a faceoff to his left. That's what it takes. That was a big block there by Quinnipiac to keep that one from getting to Peretz, and then the one shot that he did have to face there was a pretty easy save for a goaltender of his caliber, slid right into his glove there. So good defense there on that sequence by the Bobcats. Four minutes have ticked away off the clock in overtime and the further we get in the game, the heavier the legs will be as Jacob Quillen takes a draw. The Bobcats down their number one center from a five minute major penalty in the second period. Graf with the puck, number three in the nation in points, assists and goals. He gets stonewalled at center ice and a shot floats over the net from the Raiders. Anderson with it at the point, chips it and it goes into his offensive end, but Rossinen retrieves behind the goal of Yanni Peretz. He's looking for an outlet as the Bobcats circle. Lipkin getting his legs moving to receive an outlet, but it goes out to Nordquist. Nordquist chips it in and it hits off a of graph. He stands it up at the blue end and now Mitten's moving on in. He has the puck, he's been hard to shake. He cuts to the net mouth, and the stick check on a back check from the Bobcats breaks up the play. Quillen dumps it in, but he misses on the outlet pass, and now the Colgate Raiders will have another offensive draw on the Bobcats end. The swing of the pendulum, Eric. Oh yeah, the ice is, seems to be tilted right back into a little bit of Colgate's direction. They're really putting Quinnipiac on their heels a little bit the last few minutes. As we've seen throughout this game, it tends to go back and forth, kind of like a 
a seesaw, but right now it's tilted all the way in Colgate, in, yeah, excuse me, Colgate's direction. The Bobcats win the draw and they dump it out. The York Hill boys line out, Graf, a big check, gets the puck off and Lombardi chips it off to Metz as they regroup outside of their zone, make the smart play and opt to get numbers in rather than trying to force a play. Metza dumps it in, Cipollone's there first. And the puck is somewhere out of play. It looks like maybe it rolled around the glass and out of play, so there will be a draw. The Young Brothers on the ice with Bergslund and Irwin and Vachon. Actually, that faceoff will be in the neutral zone. For the Bobcats, it's that sandpaper line. A new puck in play now that hasn't seen the ice. And the faceoff will be below the scoreboard. That reads Lake Placid Olympic Center the home of the Miracle on Ice on February 22nd, 1980, USA versus USSR, a three to two victory. Right now, the Bobcats and Raiders are deadlocked at 1-1 in the fourth period of action. Five minutes have ticked off the clock. Who will play the hero this year? Well, and Brandon sends the puck into the zone. Sorry, Eric. Colgate's trailed back, or crawled back into this one on the shot board. They've evened things up at 32 apiece while still maintaining that strong defensive play and that's going to be huge for Colgate if they can come away victorious in this because they started this game really strong defensively but couldn't generate all that much offensively not they trailed in the shot board all game long but now they've even that up and maintain their strong defensive play so Alex out. Young tries to get a pass off to the front of the net and it's picked up by Metza. Metza chips it off the boards and Lombardi tries to get a stick on it to advance forward but it's broken up Peretz plays the puck behind the net to Johnson Johnson was about one stick tap away from losing it to a four-checking Raider in McGuire. And now Menderville, the six foot five, number 14 Raider, doing work in the corner, but the Bobcats break out with it. Tellier shaking hard into the boards and That's they draw a penalty. a penalty. And the Colgate Raiders take a penalty, a hard check to the numbers of Tellier. The Bobcats will now go on the power play. Pecknold's pack circling around the bench to draw up a play. The Bobcats have a chance on the man advantage to send themselves to the championship game as they'll be up on a five on four advantage. Oh yeah, Ren Pecknold is licking his chops right now, drawing up a play for this man advantage. The, Col the Colgate fans in attendance do not like that one. I'm not sure if you can hear it over the broadcast. Might be a little far, but they let out a roar of boos when the referee raised his hand on that call. But nonetheless, it's a two minute power play here for the Bobcats and a chance to win it. Jacob Quillen under center. He looks to win the face off and set up the play for the Bobcats that can send them to the ECAC championship game. It would be their fifth appearance in the program history and third in the last three years. Off the top, it comes to Lee and Norquist. Norquist off to Lee. Playing pass and catch, a shot is blocked and it's in the pads, a rebound comes out to Quillen and takes a one-timer and it goes wide. Lee battling, Quillen possessing. Quillen is checked by Bergson and a pass out to Nordquist misses. And it looks like the Bobcats have replacements on the bench ready to jump off the boards. Lee possesses, time and space here for Lee. Lee sends it back to Nordquist who weaves through the neutral zone. Nordquist misses on an outlet from Quillen and the puck's out of the zone again. 110 on the clock for the Bobcats. My apologies, 115. 13.42 remaining in the overtime period, the first overtime period of play. A five on four advantage for the Bobcats in this one one knotted game to send the team to the championship. Puck rolls off Day Young's stick and it stood up at the blue line and chipped into Guylander's zone into his glove and Lipkin's tripped up trying to retrieve it as the puck came out. Lipkin off to Tellier. Tellier bobbles with the puck. Day Young doing battle in the corner with the Colgate Raiders defense and the puck sent out. 44 seconds remain on the power play. Metza collects. Head up, he's quarterbacking. A pass off to Graf. Graf weaving through the zone. Tries to get a pass off and now Mitten's in one on one with Metza. Mitten now a two on one. Puts on the brakes. Tries to hit Young with the pass. My apologies, Vashan with the pass. And that two on one is broken up on a misfire from Vashan. Metza collects again. A little bit of panic set in there for the Bobcats. Graf. A head fake, moves into the offensive zone and chips it in. McGee's now on the ice for the Bobcats. 11 seconds, tick off the clock. 
on the power play for the Bobcats. A pass in front, McGee takes a shot and it's padded away. And now he's the first to it. Tellier chips it off to McGee who circles the net, goes for a wraparound, tries to pass it to Metza and he's tripped up. And his stick goes flying and Aaron's stick goes flying. And the officials make a call. Unsure if that's an icing after the power play. The power play is certainly over and there will be a face off in their end. So we have a power up. The power play is over, an icing play, and the Bobcats take the face off here. Wow, I don't know if chaotic even describes what we just watched. You may have to invent a new word because that was incredible. Quinnipiac comes oh so close on a few occasions to winning this game. Colgate prevents them from doing so. They had some chances of their own shorthanded, and now Quinnipiac's gonna have to watch out because as we've seen, big penalty kills, big successful penalty kills can serve as a huge momentum swing in favor of the team who killed it off, which in this case is Colgate. So the Bobcats are gonna have to be careful here and play some tight-knit defense for the next few minutes at least because there's no doubt that Colgate has just generated a ton of momentum after killing off that huge penalty. Yeah, and Colgate takes a timeout here. Smart move by the head coach in order to stop play. Give his penalty killers and Guylander a breather after killing off that power play as they ice the puck. Mitten went to the bench with his hands on his knees, out of breath. So that unit will be out again to take the draw. And if they can clear the puck, go for a line change. If not, they'll be hemmed in their zone with a Bobcats unit that's hungry coming off of a power play where they generated some chances, but not a lot. Yeah, they generated some chances there. They had, they kind of came in waves. They had a few golden opportunities and they all were kind of centered in the, in the same time frame there. For the majority of that uh, power play though, it, it seemed to be Colgate just playing really good defense, clogging the lanes and, and clearing the puck whenever they could. And if the opportunity to arose, they would skate with it and kill even more time. They even generated a, a pretty solid scoring chance out of it. The pass had just, to, it was just out of the reach of uh, one of the Raiders players cutting towards the goal, but. Friedman takes a draw here. Lombardi set up for a one-timer. Gets the puck off to Johnson, who tries to chip it past a four-checking Mitten. Mitten gets the puck out to Verboon, but Cipollone turns it over. Cipollone in with Friedman, and he misses on the pass. Lombardi takes a sh pass shot behind the net, and Friedman possesses, circling around the top of the circles, takes a shot, and a tipping from Cipollone goes into the crease, but Guylander covers. Another huge stop there from Guy Lander. He is one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reason, this game is still tied. Another huge stop there on the rebound. The shot from the point went through, got through traffic, so he couldn't see that one very well to begin with, and he was there to smother it. Huge stops there. 34 saves on 35 shots tonight for Guy Lander. Friedman in for the draw again. Gets it out to Burgart. Burgart. Swings at it, loses possession, and Nordquist takes a whack to get it back into the offensive zone and the Raiders recollect. A new unit on for them. Young, a pass off to Vashon misses, and another outlet from the Bobcats misses as well. Some miss passing plays. Anderson ends up with the puck and sends it in on net and it goes through Peretz all the way on a dump in, and Johnson loses it at his feet. The Raiders take a shot and it's blocked and Cipollone's checked as it was in his sweater. An odd play, the puck went through Peretz on a dump and it ended up behind him, so the play continued, and then another whack ended up in Joey Cipollone's jersey. Well, that was dangerous. It squeaked right through the pads of Yaniv Peretz. So close there for a chance for Colgate. I should mention earlier, coming into tonight, Yaniv Peretz needed just 29 saves to reach 700 on the season. He's now gotten 33 on 34 shots, so he has eclipsed the 700 save mark on this season in what's been a great year for him, but almost a mishap there as the puck squeezed right through him. Luckily for Yanni, it went wide of the post. The season certainly feels like it's on the line right now for both of these teams. And a shot off the pad comes out to Bergson, who takes a hard shot, and it's blockered away. And Graf chips it out of the zone. Now Quillen moving in with speed over the blue line. Three on three. Quillen stops, fires a shot, and it's blocked away by Guylander. He tries to wrap it to 
Rossin but it ends up around the boards and Graf gets tied up with a defender. Mitten coming away with the puck and he's one on one with Rossin and Rossin pumps the brakes. Mitten makes a beautiful move but Lee checks it away with his stick. A nice stick check by him and on an outlet. Looked like Graf was looking for a stretch pass but Quillen comes through the neutral zone. Uses his body to evade a defender on Anderson. Quillen battling below the circles. They lose the puck and the Young Brothers with Vashon coming the other way, three on three with Metza, Johnson, and Lombardi defending. Into the offensive end, a Young Brother. Colton, tied up by Metza, and the puck comes out to the point, but over the blue line, so it will be an offsides if they try and force entry. Alex Young sends it in. Peretz plays it, hops over his stick, and Anderson's in the corner tied up. The Raiders and Bobcats are doing battle. Metza coming away with it, circling around his crease to create some space. Sends it into the offensive zone. Guylander misplays. Janecki Nair with the puck, sends it to McGee. McGee moving on through the zone. Has possession, but it's checked off his stick. Janecki Nair in with McGee, working McGuire. Goes for the wraparound around the net mouth, but, net mouth, but it goes wide. And now Alex Young sends it off to a Colgate forward, but it's chipped away, and a hard shot on Peretz is, hits the Bobcat crest in the middle of his chest, and there will be a face-off to his right as 9.47 remains in overtime. Well, he needed that. He just needed to cover it and stop play because it was getting pretty chaotic out there. The puck was going back and forth, and right now stoppage in play is probably good for both teams to settle it down and regroup a little bit. Unsure if there is a timeout call or if this is a TV. Looks like to be a TV timeout as Yanni Peretz is coming out of his net now. Gounder and Peretz taking a breath and the team's taking a breath after some intense overtime action. Certainly not a lot of whistles unless it's a face-off, an icing, or an offsides. Great play from both goaltenders. One goal separates these teams from advancing to compete for the Whitelaw Cup which will allow them to have an automatic bid into the NCAA tournament, and it will crown them the champion and winner of the conference tournament. Now, granted, the Bobcats have won three Cleary Cups, which means they've won the conference regular season the last three seasons, but they've yet to eclipse and get over that final hump of winning the ECAC championship. They have not won the White Law, lost three to two in overtime the last two years in this tournament. Yeah, it's been a struggle once they get to Lake Placid in recent years, but they can't think about that right now. That's in the past, this is now. And if they dwell on that, if that's in the back of their minds, they're not focusing on the game, which is happening as we speak. So they can't have that in the back of their minds. And for Colgate, same thing. They've had quite a history here. And right now, it's all about the game that's being played right now. 1-1 one, one with 9.47 to go. Shots are evened up at 36 apiece. What a game. Do these players feel the ghosts of the 1980 USA Olympic team? Do they feel the atmosphere? The crowd chants as there's a draw on the Bobcats end. And the Raiders come away with it and get a shot on Edin Peretz is knocked into. A shot from the point is saved. Menderville doing a good job on Legault in the corner. Menderville working in the corner to get the puck out. And a the official's arm is up as Gondor hits the net and the Raiders draw a penalty. The Bobcats look to touch up, but the Raiders possess in their zone as Gondor's pulled and they'll be six on five on the delayed penalty. Mitten moving on through the offensive zone. The puck knocked off his stick and now the Bobcats will be on the penalty kill and the Raiders will be on the power play here in overtime. Well, the Bobcats penalty kill has been great all year long and it's gonna have to stay that way on this kill here as Legault heads to the box. A very untimely penalty for number six in gold there to head off for the next two minutes, unless of course Colgate scores, the Raiders will have a five on four man advantage. Bad timing here for Quinnipiac, but let's see if Colgate can turn the tide here as they have had some impressive penalty kills of their own. Now their chance on a man advantage. Anderson off to Vashon. Anderson to Vashon, a one-timer blocked by De Young off his boot, and he circles around the boards. But his pass from point man to point man. Young tries to get a pass through and reaches the intended target, but it's broken up by the Bobcats. The Bobcats coming away with it. De Young with the puck. 
moving through the neutral zone. It falls off his stick, and a Raider goes down, but no call. And Johnson sends it out all the way down the ice for Guylander to pick up. Anderson, head up with the puck, quarterback in the power play, moves through the neutral zone. On his forehand, sends a pass off to LaBelle. LaBelle works to Bobcats, gets a pass off to Mid, who shoots and misses the top shelf on the left side. And Friedman gets a jump, but it's too far for him. LaBelle sending it back to Irwin. Irwin recollects, head up, sends it back to Mitten. Mitten's played with jump in overtime here. LaShawn moving through the offensive zone. Gets a pass off to himself off the boards, but it's checked away. And Lee sends it off the glass, but not out of the zone. But the pass is broken up and Friedman chases. Another change for the penalty killers. The Bobcats rolling different penalty killers quickly. Lee takes a shot off the official. Now Burgard has it. Burgard's moving on in all alone, but he's checked by Irwin and he just sends it into the zone. 22 seconds, ticks off the clock as Dayon gets to the puck first. De Young trying to cause havoc in on the four check on the penalty kill. And successfully does so as Irwin collects it behind his net. Irwin with the puck, heads up. Sends it off for Young to gain some speed. Five seconds tick off the clock here. And Young breaks into the zone. Young chips it around the boards to Lipkin. And the Raiders come away with it. A pass off from Verboon, but Lipkin breaks it up. Mets a doom battle below the dots, but he's all alone. The Bobcats are tired. A pass into the slots broken up, but the pass comes out to Bergsland. Bergsland takes a shot and goes high off the glass and around. Day Young breaks it up. He's looking for a change. Puck on his stick, heads up, cuts through the neutral zone, takes it himself, dishes it off to Lipkin. Lipkin off to Day Young. Day Young tries to get a pass off to Nordquist and does battle to contain the puck as he and Lipkin fight for it at the blue line and it comes out of the zone. Nordquist gets the puck taken off of his stick and the Raiders move on in and a shot goes wide. And the Bobcats come away with it. Graf didn't have full possession and Glassman retrieves it. A puck off Graf's stick hits an outlet for Raymond. Raymond pumps the brakes and shakes off Nordquist. Raymond on his forehand slings a shot off the netting and out of play. And 6.06 remain in overtime, 36 to 38 in shots. The Raiders leading in that category. It's a 1-1 game. Next goal, golden goal, could be what sends the Raiders or the Bobcats to a national championship if they capture the White Law Cup. Well, it's the first time all game that Colgate's led in the shot category, and that's thanks to that power play. But Quinnipiac really had a solid penalty kill there. They only allowed one or two quality chances for Colgate. And other than that, this has been almost like a game of ping pong. This overtime period has been back and forth. It started off really defensively, tightly knit, but after those first five minutes or so, this game has been back and forth, opportunity after opportunity, but no goals to show for it. The Raiders start from their own end. DePaulo sends it on in. For LaBelle, number seven of the Raiders. And Legault sends it around for Lee, but Lee's tied up and bodied in the corner. LaBelle gets the puck around McGee to the point to Irwin. And a one-timer comes out, and the rebound squeaks out. Lee takes a, looks for a block, but Perez makes the blocker save on Nick Anderson and shuts it down. The Bobcats fending off a fury of opportunities from the Raiders. Well, and there's the ECAC goalie of the year right there. Great positioning there. Where, when he needs to be, the glove was in great position. The puck goes right into it, and he keeps this team, or he keeps his team in this game. And another draw to his left as Friedman goes against one of the young brothers. And a pass off in front, and a soft dish comes out on a rebound. Perrett's making the save, and Lombardi charging up ice. Lombardi chips the puck around Bergsland. Bergsland possessing behind his own net. Friedman on him. And the puck comes out. Metza trying to dish it off on his backhand. And Vachon falls to the ice. Johnson shovels it off to Cipollone. Cipollone misses on an outlet to Lombardi, who's working in the neutral zone. And Cipollone goes for a check to retrieve it from one of the young brothers, but fails in his attempt at the puck's out of play. There'll be a stoppage again. Yeah, well, that was just a classic play in the neutral zone. Puck kind of 
pinballed around a little bit and eventually goes out into the bench. And that's a sign of good defense. Neither team really letting the other one cross the blue lines. And that's what you'd expect with just under five minutes to go in the overtime period. Again, I made the comparison earlier, no doubles defense in baseball. Just main priority, don't let the other team score. And if an opportunity arises for your team to score, take it. But top priority for both these teams right now, I'd imagine, is just keep the other team at bay and don't give up any goals. Capitalize on your opportunities, certainly. Philly and off to Tellier, the Sherbrooke boys move in. Tellier gets to the puck first and works it in Gretzky's office, bodying off Anderson. Sends a pass off to Norquist at the point who gets it off to Rossin, and Rossin in a shot goes through traffic but doesn't pinball off of anybody. That's what the look was, Tellier. Off to Nordquist, tries to get a pass off to Fillion, but the Raiders intercept. Anderson with the puck. Anderson over the red line, takes a slap shot on net, and Peretz blockers it away. Fillion tries to dump it off the same wing, and Chinecki Nair comes away with it. Chinecki Nair with some speed through the neutral zone, heads up, gets it off to Tellier, but Tellier looks slow to the puck. Chinecki Nair has it. Chinecki Nair around. Tellier doing battle with Stark. Off to Fillion in the slot. Lee takes a shot, and it's blocked by McGuire. Raymond in the corner without a stick is checked by... Fillion, who's one on three in the corner. Chinecki Nair on Stark. Chinecki Nair gains the puck. Lee takes a shot. It's tipped off a graph stick and just bobbles in the air. And now Mitten retrieves it. Number 17 for the Raiders, streaking down ice. Has it on the forehand, dumps it into the offensive zone and goes for a change. Peretz collected behind the net. 3.43 on the clock in overtime. Lipkin off his stick into the offensive zone and Quillen's in. Quillen gets bodied into the corner by Bergslin. Glassman off to Pearson. And LaBelle's checked off the puck. LaBelle recollects. Metzis steps up, loses his man, and a shot goes through the crease but wide. Quillen can't retrieve it on an outlet. And Brandon has the puck. He sends it into the defensive end, and it'll be an icing on the Raiders on a little bit of a poorly judged play by Brandon to get it out of the zone for an outlet. They'll now have a face-off in their defensive end. Well, this is going to be a big face-off for the Bobcats if they can win it back late in this overtime. If they can win it back, they are, they've are they got one of their top lines out there right now with DeYoung on the wing. He's got the lone goal in this one for the Bobcats. DeYoung, a pass-off off the face-off to Johnson. Johnson bounces off his stick. DeYoung with it. Sends it around to McGee. It tips off his stick and wide. Bergar with the puck. Gets tripped up by Panetta. Panetta, the goal scorer for the Raiders. DeYoung, the goal scorer for the Bobcats, both on the ice currently. A chip off the glass from Panetta, and Johnson recollects. Johnson off to DeYoung. At his skates at the red line, he can't possess, and he stays still as Johnson retrieves it. Johnson off the boards to DeYoung. DeYoung on his forehand, charging down the wing. Tries to cut in, but he's checked hard by Bergson and buried in the slot. Puck comes out now to Vachon. Vachon tries to cut to the net and make a move, but he's checked off the puck and now the puck comes the other way. CJ McGee up ice, number five in gold. Goes to the slot, takes a shot, looking for the wickets, but Guylander gets down to make the save in Butterfly. Rossin and now charging forward and it's an icing on the Raiders. The Bobcats will look to deploy a unit to get the game breaking golden goal in the building of miracles here with 2.16 remaining in overtime. Well, that's back-to-back -back icings there from Colgate. And if you're Quinnipiac, that's what you want. Keep putting the pressure on so they're forced to just send it out and take the icing. Keep those tired legs on because the more they skate, the more that'll be an advantage for the Bobcats and trying to get one goal here. Cipollone in on the forecheck, Friedman and Lombardi on the ice. The two goal scorers from last year's game against the Colgate Raiders, a cut from Young is unsuccessful as he stood up. Cipollone now loses it at the blue line and the official skates and there's some booze. Irwin with the puck on the sidewall, takes a shot and it's gloved by Peretz, the ECAC goaltender of the year. Well, we've said that quite a bit tonight, saved by Peretz. He's got another one there, keeps his team, keeps his team in it. That's his 37th save of the evening while Guy Lander on the other end or excuse me, that's his 40th save of the evening. Guy Lander's got 37 tonight. It has been a goaltending duel for the most part of this game. There have been a monster volume of shots on net for both goaltenders, which they have handled 
and the Bobcats chip it out of the zone and it trickles down and it'll look like another the icing's blown and waved off emphatically by the official. And the Raiders come away with it anyway, but it's broken up by Fillion, and now that'll certainly be an icing play by Chinecki in air. They got a break on the first icing, but they ice it again, and they'll be in their own end. Yeah, the refs aren't going to let that go by twice, especially after that first one. Well, another big face-off here to the right of Yaniv Peretz. Again, if Colgate wins it back, they can generate a four check with a minute and a half to go. And if Quinnipiac can win it back, they can exit the zone, which again, with this much time remaining, or this little time remaining, I should say, would be huge. The Raiders win the face off and take a shot and the rebound squeaks out, but it trickles to a Bobcat and now they break out Fillion moving in on Irwin. Fillion on the four check now as Anderson possesses. Irwin up the wall. To McGuire, who stood up. Graf takes a shot, and it's gloved by Guylander. Graf, one of the nation's best, stood up by 37. My goodness, we have seen a ton of beautiful stops tonight from Carter Guylander, and that was towards the top of the list. Easily one of his best of the night. An amazing point blank stop from Carter Guylander. I mean, the resume speaks for itself. He was drafted by Detroit, so obviously he's good, but my goodness, he is earning it tonight. Tellier, a shot bounces out, and it was free for the taking, but the play is blown on a quick whistle from the officials, and we'll have a draw again. Tellier, Lipkin, and Quinn on the ice. One of the nation's best against one of the top ECAC goaltenders on that play. Looks like the Raiders will make the change in their defensive end, put the Youngs out with Vashon, the young brothers, Colton and Alex facing off against Quillen and Lipkin. Bergslin comes away with it off the draw. Tellier tries to stand it up at the blue line. Quillen coming in to help his partner and they possess. The Bobcats at their blue line now. A pass to Johnson who tries to get past Alex Young. Doesn't successfully do so. Young going in and Peretz looks to play the puck. Dishes it off to Nordquist. 41 seconds tick off in overtime here. Now Lipkin has the puck. He chips it off the wall to himself but can't get to it. And now Friedman's in. Friedman goes for a heavy check but misses. Mitten on the ice. Rossinen on an in zone turnover. Gets the puck. Rossinen fighting Mitten in the corner. Lipkin a check on Irwin. And now Vachon comes out with it. My apologies, that's Verboon. Tellier with the puck. Off the glass to Mitten. Mitten has the puck on the sidewall and can't be checked off of by Metza. Verboon out in front, the puck bobbles, and it's sent all the way down ice, looking to be on goal, and it slows down in time for no icing. Anderson behind the net and zeros across the board. Overtime is over. We are headed to a second overtime in the ECAC semifinal between the Bobcats and the Raiders. They're gonna need the luck of the Irish in the second overtime. Eric, what did you observe in the first overtime? Well, in the first overtime, it started off, as I mentioned, defensively minded. It was defense first, but as it progressed, it became more of, I mentioned earlier, a ping pong match. It was back and forth opportunities on either end of the ice, but both goaltenders stood tall as they have all evening long. 39 stops for Gielander and 41 for Yaniv Peretz. It's been, that's been the story of the game is the netminders. And we'll see what happens in the second overtime. Yeah, Eric, we certainly could tell that there was a pace and an intensity that you could feel the, the nerves, right? I feel, I feel like with a lot of the checks that were being thrown, a lot of the plays that were being made, you could feel the nerves when there was even the slightest bit of a break in. You could feel that the, the nerves of the players on the ice. It's a completely different game in overtime, and especially for a Bobcats team that's lost two years in a row in the championship game in overtime. 14 minutes until the double overtime period, the fifth period of action. 40 shots for the Bobcats, 43 for the Raiders, 83 combined, a one goal game apiece. Pinella and DeYoung, the goal scorers, 14 minutes until double overtime where we will see miracles happen. Welcome back to QBSN for double overtime of the ECAC semifinal between the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Colgate Raiders. Sudden death overtime wasn't enough. They wanted more. They're going to need the luck of the Irish to break the ice and get that golden goal. 
in an arena where one of the most historic hockey games ever played was played by the United States of America and the USSR. A 3-2 victory on February 22, 1980 brings the ECAC tournament to Herbrooks Arena in the Lake Placid Olympic Center. I'm Matthew Mugno here with Eric Zank. Eric, what's the story here in double overtime? Well, I wish I could tell you. I would think there's going to be some sort of ice-breaking goal in this period. I felt like at the end of the last overtime, both teams were starting to kind of generate, like I said, earlier at the, at the conclusion of that first overtime, it, it reminded me of a game of ping pong where it was just offense back and forth, back and forth, and both goaltenders stood tall. But law of averages, one of these shots has to get through for either side. Either I don't think the momentum is really in either one of these teams' favors. I, I, I think it's it's pretty much dead even right now. It's, it's either one of these teams' games. But I, I do think a goal is going to be scored in this period, and if not, then everyone loves more overtime. So... But we got 20 minutes here for one goal, and I, I do think that no matter what team it is, someone's going to break the ice in this one. Just just based off of how last period ended, it seemed like one of these teams was bound to break through at some point. So we'll see what happens. Ten seconds until puck drop. The York Hill boys for the Bobcats in Lipkin, Quillen, and Graf. Line up with Metza and Johnson, and for the Raiders, Verboon, DePaulo, and Mitten. On the defensive end, looks to be Irwin and Bergsland. We are at the whim of destiny as double overtime kicks off. A 20-minute period, knotted up at 1-1 apiece. One of these players will score the golden goal. One of them will create a mini miracle here in the ECAC semifinal in the Cathedral of the United States hockey. Who will it be? We are bound to find out. Double overtime starting right now well i'll tell you one thing the players on the two teams that are set to play on deck cole or uh, yeah, excuse me, cornell and harvard those players have got to be licking their chops right now one i'm sure they're getting antsy and two they know that if they can win tonight they will be playing a pretty fatigued team no matter whether whether it's quinnipiac or colgate both these teams are going to be pretty tired tomorrow yeah you have to think Gabe, our multimedia producer, just informed me before that it's 50 minutes until the puck will drop between Cornell and Harvard, the other side of the semifinal. So the other side of the bracket, their chance at a championship bid will now be pushed back 50 minutes. The original puck drop set for 7 o'clock, and right now it's 7.28. So they're certainly been sitting, warming up, just waiting for whatever result will occur in this game that will result in a one-goal Miracle golden goal opportunity for either side. Irwin comes away with it on the draw. The Raiders get it out of the zone. Mitten missed on the intercept. And Johnson possesses. Johnson for the Bobcats. Off the boards to Quillen. The puck knocked off his stick. Verboon, Verboon in on the four check. And the puck comes out to Irwin in the neutral zone. Squeaks back to DePaulo who sends it in. Number 28 for the Raiders. Going for a change now. Metza behind his net. Eyes up looking 200 feet down ice. Hits Quillen. Quillen dumps it into the offensive zone and is picked up by Brandon. Brandon slides it off to Anderson. Anderson hits Young. Young slings it back to Anderson who possesses and he looks for the outlet in Vashon. Vashon a shot on Peretz and he covers a face off to his left. Yeah, well we've seen all game long. They're gonna have to generate a better opportunity than that. We've Goal t both goaltenders have proven that wrist shots from the high circle are not going to be beating them anytime soon. And for the draw for the Bobcats, TJ Friedman's taken over. Sky Brindamore was ejected in the second period. They're the top ECAC faceoff man and the defensive forward of the year for the conference is out of the game. But Colton Young's in the game as it looked like he would be injured on a knee on knee play from Brindamore. Lombardi misses on a two-on-one attempt. Outlet. Did not get the shot off and didn't get into the zone. And now he's the first four-checker in on Anderson. Anderson spins away and creates space for himself to operate. He tries to sling a pass off to Glassman, who is open. But DeYoung and Tellier tie him up. And Aaron Stick comes out. The Raiders will have a power play here in double overtime on a Tellier trip. 
Yeah, there's no doubt about that. It didn't look to be intent. Well, I, it wasn't intentional, but that was certainly a trip. The rest can't not call that one. And another arms up. It could be a five on three as another stick got in the lane over the red line. And the Raiders circle around their net. Mitten with the pulled goalie for the six on five. Works using his nice hands, but he's checked off the puck and the puck comes out now to Bergson and Mitten takes a shot and it hits off the side of the net. And DeYoung intercepts and either one or two Bobcats will go to the box and they'll have to kill off a penalty. Fillion's down in the slot right now. Unsure if he took a hard check or what happened, but he's slow to get up. Well, Colgate almost didn't need a power play. That chance from in tight was very close to a, a game-winning goal there, but Peretz was able to, to shake it off. Still, no Bobcats have walked into the penalty box. Looking like Although Michael Marty's Lombardi. going. I thought it was Tellier with the penalty, but it looks like it'll be just one man. So the Bobcats will be down one man on the penalty kill. Well, we've seen really, really solid penalty kills all game long from both of these teams especially the last period. Quinnipiac's got to have at least one more in him here for the next two minutes. Anderson off the draw to Colton Young. Anderson at the blue line, sends it off to Alex Young. Alex the trigger man on that right flank, guarded by Bergart. Looking for a lane, but he's defended. And Bergart takes away his space. Johnson hacking away at it. And Manderville has the puck below the circles and he works it to Verboon. Verboon to Manderville and he's checked by Johnson. A great play. Johnson on his knees though, can't get back up. Alex Young and a pass broken up by Johnson who gets back, who tried to hit Verboon back door. Johnson swings it, but Verboon intercepts. Verboon out to Young and it goes wide. Perrette's back in his crease. Swings it to Alex Young. Alex Young to Anderson at the point. Bergard steps up. Alex Young takes a shot and it goes wide. Verboon possessing. Anderson at the point, sends it to him. On a kite-like system, Metza breaks up another pass and checks Colton Young in the corner. And Bergard gets the puck out of the zone. A player who has seen limited ice time all season making big plays here in double overtime on the penalty kill. Well, a much needed clear there for the Bobcats. A much needed change because those legs were getting tired real fast in gold. So both teams get fresh legs on here with just about 40 seconds to go in the man advantage. Vashawn tries to walk in the zone and Jaden Lee steps up and stops him at the blue line. No entrance there for Vashawn. And the Raiders look to work it from their end. 21 seconds tick, my apologies, 27 seconds tick off the power play clock for the Raiders. They've had a few good opportunities. Vashawn in first, Rossinen takes him down. Lipkin ties it up and Rossinen ties it up behind the net. Lipkin doing battle and the puck comes all the way out and Irwin can't get to it in time. Eight seconds tick off and the Bobcats look to kill off the end of this power play. The Raiders possessing and Lombardi's out of the box. The Bobcats kill off a bad penalty in double overtime. And the Raiders sling it into the zone. Bergslin off his stick. Raymond, number 18. Gets it into the offensive zone and Glassman spins around for a pass in front, but it hits nobody. And the Raiders defenseman retreats to pick it up for Brandon. A change for the lineup for the Bobcats and they get fresh legs. Norquist in behind the net, eyes up, sends it off the glass and it comes out to Bergslin. Bergslin walks over the red line, chips it off the glass around the boards again for Norquist. Norquist there first, off sip low and stick it bobbles. Janecki and air in. On his backhand, feathers it across, and it goes through the crease, but Guylander makes the save, and the puck bounces off the glass and out of the zone. Lee hits Metza. Metza with a head of steam. Puck on his forehand, passes it! Back door from McGee, and he's robbed by Guylander sliding side to side. I mean, you gotta be kidding me. Guylander is everywhere at once tonight, sliding cross crease to make that save. Holy moly, what a stop there from Carter Guylander. He just continues to amaze all night long with these stops. Starting to feel like who will break first, right, Eric? It doesn't seem like any of them are going to. Guylander makes a beautiful save on that two-on-one, but what fundamentals, how do you keep your composure in that situation? Well, 
follow the puck for one, but just, I mean, goalies are a different breed. We know that, and they have certain ways of staying focused, and uh, whatever's working for Guylander, you, you got to keep doing it because 41 stops tonight on 42 shots, and probably about 10 of them could go on ESPN's highlight reel. Maybe we'll see one when we awaken tomorrow, but we could be here all night. Carter Guylander against the Bobcats this season, 27 saves and a 925 save percentage in the victory on January 21st. And on November 4th, the game prior to that in Hamden, 41 saves, his season high, which is now broken as he's made 43 saves here tonight, a 924, and the goals he allowed all in the power play. So Guylander plays the Bobcats hard. He's played them well all season, and it's translating into a playoff performance. Well, we've seen it happen before where a goalie can get hot and steal you some wins, especially deep into the playoffs. And Guylander's doing everything he can to do that for his Colgate team. Unfortunately for him, Yaniv Peretz has been just as solid on the other end of the ice and not making it easy for the Raiders. Bobcats come away with it off the draw, and Fillion's doing battle in the corner. Graf on the ice with Friedman and Fillion and the Raiders come away with it. Here comes Colton Young. Colton Young tries to dish a pass off and it's broken up, but Colton Young backhands it towards the net and the Bobcats are scrambling. The puck's in front and Peretz covers just in time before Colton Young can get there. Well, again, a dangerous opportunity there this time for the Raiders and Peretz is there. Not exactly the, the same caliber of save that his fellow netminder, Gielander, made 20, 200 feet away from him just a few seconds ago, but Nonetheless, a stop and a cover to keep this game knotted up at one. It's like two aces in the World Series. They'll never actually face off against each other, but they're looking 200 feet down the ice at one another. They've each only allowed one shot on 40 plus shots this evening, 45 for the Colgate Raiders, 42 for the Bobcats, and there's only one goal aside. The goal scorers, Daniel Panetta and Ethan DeYoung. Now the Raiders come away with it on the draw. Anderson's shot goes wide, and Peretz is able to cover up on the backdoor opportunity. And a whiff, Burgart's moving on in. He has puck on stick, and he's checked hard into Guylander and goes down. And Guylander gets launched. The net gets launched. Burgart goes hard into the boards. Looks like nobody's injured on the play, but Guylander's shaking up a little bit. He's taking a skate outside of the crease. Looked like he took a hard shot from Burgard, who's moving in with all of his speed. Burgard's a pretty big boy. Ooh, Gounder got launched. Everyone seems okay, but he went for a ride on that one. And I mean, that play just shows what this game means. These players know full well what is on the line here. And Burgard was in on a partial break, but the defenseman there from Colgate did everything he could and to, to stop that opportunity, and that included taking out his netminder in the process, but the puck stayed out and that was his only intention there. Looked like he, Burgard couldn't create enough space for himself. He, he couldn't separate from the defender and that's what drove them into the net. It, it looked like he couldn't get that extra stride forward. Like we see a lot of skaters, Colin Graf, one of them that he can create separation with his speed. Not that Burgard is lacking speed, but just on that play, by the time he got to the puck, looked like he, he couldn't get that extra step. Now Rossinen sends it into the zone and the puck squeaks out oddly into the slot, filling in whiffs on a one-timer, and Panetta comes away with it, the goal scorer for the Raiders in this game. Panetta retreats to behind his net and sends it off for an outlet. Off Manderville, sticking into the zone. Puck off the glass and out of the Bobcats end. Rossinen ices the puck, and there'll be a face-off to the left of Peretz. Well, just when we think that the ice is going to be broken here in what would be the first goal in since the third regulation period. The play seems to settle down a little bit for a few minutes before it inevitably, be, it inevitably will pick up again. But it, it is the fifth period of action here. You're right. It's been two periods now of overtime. We're six minutes into this double overtime. Uh, it's been a marathon here in Lake Placid, but of all the places to have a, a five period hockey game, I guess this is the one. You're right. Maybe a player will have a ghost from the past speak to them. Where's Mike Aruzioni in one of their ears? Ethan DeYoung 
puck chipped off his stick and it looked like the Raiders could have broken in three on one, but Rossin gets back. Mitten checks him hard into the boards behind the net. Verboon coming to support as well as Ethan DeYoung. Tellier misses an assignment. Anderson waits, waits, circles. It makes the Bobcats' knees buckle. Verboon takes a shot and it goes wide and a bounce off Tellier almost goes back door on Peretz who covers. Ooh, that was close there for Peretz. He had his eye on it the whole time, but it took a wacky bounce just in front of him and it kind of lobbed. It didn't have much on the shot, but the puck almost fluttered behind him, but he was alert there to make that stop. His 44th of the evening. Yanni Peretz has stood tall, as has Carter Guylander, looking at each other from down the ice. Jacob Quillen in against Colton Young, the player we thought would have been out for the game. Instead, that's Skylar Brynamore who took the penalty in the five minute. Quillen makes a nice move to Sashay on by, dumps it off to himself and is rubbed out along the boards. Graf joins his centerman, trying to retrieve the puck behind the net, but Berg Bergslin does a good job on the two Bobcat Yum forwards. Vachon sends it into the zone, but Nordquist comes away with it and chips it high off the glass of the Lake Superior State transfer. A bobble play from Lipkin. Raiders looking for a high stick call, but it's broken up. And the Raiders come away with it on a turnover. Moving on in. They take a shot at Perez, makes the save, and the rebound squeaks out, but a big back check saves the Bobcats from Nordquist. And now Lipkin comes the other way with Lee. Lipkin shoots, and it rolls off his stick. And McGuire sends it into the neutral zone, and Friedman steps up and breaks that play up. Friedman misses on a poke check. Lipkin and Friedman tied up along the boards at the blue line by the Raiders D, Raymond and Manderville. Irwin off to his partner Anderson. Anderson looking to quarterback the play, looking for an outlet. Sends it off and it hits Lee's stick, trickles into the Bobcats zone for McGuire to receive and a high elbow catches Lee who goes down and drops his stick. No arm from the official, Metzer retrieves. He does a great job spinning and making space for himself on a hard four check from McGuire. Metzer with the puck. The lefty advancing, 49th captain in team history right there. Graduate student, Friedman with the puck. Another grad, same class. Missouri native to Metza. Off to Johnson. Johnson moving on in, takes a shot and it's blocked by Glassman, who's been all over the, the ice here this afternoon, evening, and night at Lake Placid, Herbrooks Arena, and an offsides play on an outlet from Johnson to Lombardi forces a neutral zone play and face off. Well, I saw Friedman slam his stick in anger as he went to the bench there. He knew that pass that he sent across the blue line was a little too hot to handle for his teammate, and that could it forced the Bobcats to exit the zone in what could have been a, a strong chance to win this game, and now instead the face off is sent back down just outside the Quinnipiac into the ice. Well, folks, if you're joining us now, it's 1-1. The shot count's over 40, and we're in double overtime in the Arena of Miracles, Lake Placid, New York, for the ECAC semifinal. Puck dumped in. Verboon on his backhand, rolls off his stick, but it comes out to DePaul, takes a shot, and the rebound comes out, and Mayan scores! Mayan number 17! to score and send the Colgate Raiders to the ECAC championship game. The Colgate Raiders have defied the odds as the dark horse and defeated the Quinnipiac Bobcats, the number one seed. Two to one victory. The championship, the White Law Cup within grasp and they'll face Cornell or Harvard in the championship game for the ECAC conference. My gosh, well it took long enough, four and a half periods of hockey and Colgate finally breaks the ice. The Quinnipiac season as Colgate, as the Raiders celebrate on one end of the ice, they know they're playing tomorrow against one of either Harvard or Cornell. And on the other end of the ice, the Quinnipiac Bobcats who were ranked one in the nation on several occasions throughout the season, came into this tournament Ranked number one, they were in the one seed, and they now realize, as they enter the handshake line, one of the greatest traditions in hockey, that their season is over. The Mitten Miracle in Lake Placid, New York, a two to one victory for the Colgate Raiders as the Bobcats are sent packing from Lake Placid. The one seed upset 
The Colgate Raiders advancing to their fourth appearance, the only tournament championship they've ever had, 1990. A chance to break that against Harvard or Cornell, two of the ECAC's top programs. Eric, what went wrong for the Bobcats this evening besides that one goal? Was it really that one goal? I really think it was. They played a, a really strong game defensively. They had some mishaps here and there, but luckily for them, Yaniv Peretz was strong as anything, and you can't really pin either of those two goals on him. The first one, the, the breakaway, all the way back in the second period, and this one was just, it was one of those goals we talked about earlier that was going to have to happen to beat one of these netminders. It wasn't a goal that you'd see. It wasn't a fancy goal. It was a rebound. Peretz was down, and Colgate was able to just tuck it between Peretz's skates and the post while Yaniv was down. So it was just a hard luck goal there to give up for Quinnipiac and for Colgate. They'll take it. They're on to tomorrow, the championship game against, like I said, either Harvard or Cornell. But yeah, that goal it is hard to put on Yaniv Peretz. He was down. He did all he could. It was just an unfortunate bounce for the Bobcats. But unfortunate bounce or not, it's still a goal. They're defeated now uh, once again. Lombardi, as I spoke to yesterday, wanted to, and I quote, right the wrong from last season. Unfortunately for him, couldn't do that. They're handed another loss in Lake Placid. Now, Eric. Eric Zank is a first year. I am a senior. I've witnessed the Bobcats in Lake Placid. 2020, the tournament's canceled. 2021, they lose to St. Lawrence in the championship. Three to two in overtime. They lose last season to Harvard, Matthew Coronado, overtime game winner for Harvard, three to two championship game. And now they lose in double overtime against the Colgate Raiders in the semifinal match. They don't advance to the championship. They're sent home. They may make the national tournament. The winner of the White Law Cup automatically gets the bid. We'll see the Bobcats fate in the air with the regional they will most likely make it considering their credibility and what they've done this entire season. But now, even an NCAA tournament win looks like it's out of not out of the question, but certainly in question for the Bobcats. Perfectly said, yeah. Not out of the question, but yeah, it, it's definitely in question. It's it's debatable. You know, Quinnipiac showed tonight that, the, you know, there were chances, they had endless chances to win tonight. They just couldn't bury it. And when you get to this point in the season, you got to bury your chances, especially the amount and the caliber of chances that they had tonight. So unfortunate for, unfortunate for them, considering the season they had, to lose to Colgate. But, I mean, kudos to Colgate. They didn't just, you know, go away. Like, it would be easy to come into this tournament against a, a number one seed like Quinnipiac and say, oh, we probably don't have a shot. But they gave Quinnipiac a run for their money and then some. And they beat the one seed, and that's... That's nothing to sneeze at if you're, uh, if, you're, if you're Colgate. The underdog defeats the top dog. David defeats Goliath. And now the Colgate Raiders will advance to the championship and face either Harvard or Cornell. 49 minutes until puck drop for that game. For Eric Zank, I'm Matthew Mugno. Thank you so much for joining us on QBSN and keeping with us for the double overtime victory for the Colgate Raiders. Thanks for listening. Have a good night.